potential predictor of future crimes or potential indicator of other issues going on at the same time. And I want to emphasize that word potential. As Laurentina mentioned, not every child who hurts animals is going to grow up to become a serial killer. But as she said, what happens at home doesn't necessarily stay at home. And they go on um, and repeat this process over and over again. When we collaborate together to prevent and prosecute and punish animal abuse offenders and to punish interpersonal and interspecies violence, we certainly benefit man's best friend, our little four-legged friends, right? But we also benefit man, and we really benefit woman. And you'll see how the domestic violence aspect of this is so overwhelmingly significant. We've identified numerous types of links uh, in this model. Probably the most significant and the most common is this issue of violence against women. Most domestic violence is a man abusing a woman. We have women who abuse men, we have domestic violence in, in same-sex relationships, but it's usually a man hurting a woman. And it's not just physical violence, it's emotional and psychological and financial exploitation and many other aspects of it. Because the woman and the child, children in the household have these strong emotional attachments to their pets, it's what we call the human-animal bond, that becomes a point of vulnerability. And abusers will exploit any weakness they can find. And by threatening the animal, it's a very effective way to keep the woman and the child from leaving. In the United States right now, it takes at least seven or eight times of uh, incidents of abuse before she finally is able to leave. When animal abuse is involved, it's often 50 incidents before she leaves, okay? It's a very complex situation. This becomes a form of emotional extortion. It is a form of power and control. And so because she's afraid of what will happen to the animals, she stays with the children. They're trapped, they're being held hostage, and it's a way to intimidate her and to retaliate against not only her and the children, but also any family or friends who help her escape. It's an extremely dangerous situation. We have a similar situation in child sexual abuse, where the abuser warns the little boy or the little girl that if they tell what happened, he'll kill her pet or his pet. And now the child is not only worried about his own or her own safety, but now also has to worry about the welfare of beloved pets as well. Again, it's coercion and power and control. The implications of child, children who not only hurt animals, but who also witness animal cruelty can be a lifelong problem because they become desensitized to the violence and they escalate from hurting animals to hurting people. Animal hoarding can affect any age group, but it tends to be an older population, so it tends to affect uh, senior citizens, and it's always linked with other issues, psychological problems, financial problems, public health issues. Uh, it always takes a multidisciplinary response, and unfortunately, the recidivism rate is 100%. We have not found a cure for animal hoarding yet. They always go back to doing it again. Dog fighting and cock fighting are tremendous problems globally, and they are linked with homicides, drug trafficking, human trafficking, weapons offenses, and numerous other crimes as well. Plus, the children are, who go to these events are exposed to just brutal animal violence. And then we also have the latest area of the link and the most unpleasant one to talk about, which is animal sexual abuse or bestiality. Uh, there are people who prefer to have sex with animals. They think of it as a legitimate uh, sexual preference. It is not. Uh, when we have a raid for animal pornography, and there's a lot of, an of animal pornography online, we always find child pornography as well. Very close links between child pornography and sex with animals. Animal abuse is a human health concern, and these are just several examples of this. Uh, one study was looking at fatal dog bites in the United States. We have a phenomenon uh, in the U.S. and probably in Portugal as well with pit bulls or fighting dogs, bully breed dogs as they are sometimes called. 
and they've been singled out, they are in fact more dangerous and they do cause more uh, attacks. Uh, Gary Petronik uh, did this study in 2013. He looked at every dog bite fatality, 256 people who'd been killed by dogs over a 10 year period. And pit bulls were overrepresented. But what was even more significant that was that regardless of what breed of dog was involved, more than one fifth of them were animals that had been abused. They fought back the only way they could with their teeth. Violence begets violence. It's as simple as that. A more recent work by Andrew Campbell in Indianapolis, in the state of Indiana, found that law enforcement officers fear going into a domestic violence confrontation more than any other crime scene that they go into. Because it's always dangerous, it's always volatile, and there's a high risk of death for the police officers who go into a domestic violence situation. That risk to the law enforcement officer doubles when there is also law, uh, when there's also animal abuse involved. Jenny Edwards is doing research in, on animal sexual abuse. Some of her findings have showed 31 percent of people who've been convicted for se having sex with animals have also had uh, sex uh, offenses involving children and adults. Tremendous overlaps. These are just some of the many, many statistics that we have. Animal welfare affects society. And the problem we run into is that people in the human services sector or in government, when they think of families, this is what they see. They think of children and the parents, and there may be an extended family, and the pets are always on the outside. And they say, oh, you take care of pets. Isn't that nice? So you go do that. I'm working with more important things. I'm taking care of the people. Okay? And we see that in many different aspects. Veterinarians don't make anywhere near the same money that uh, physicians do. Animal welfare agencies in the United States get approximately one half of 1% of all charitable contributions. Government animal control agencies that take care of stray animals running loose get even less. And so it's just always a minimal priority. We need to change this model. And the way to do that is very simple, by realizing that the pets are members of the family and that an overwhelming majority of people in all countries think of their pets as close companions and family members. It makes the veterinarian the other family doctor. And it puts the veterinarian on the front line of preventing crimes against animals and gets people in the human services sector to realize when they're dealing with a family, they need to include the four-legged members of the family as well. Talk very briefly about the different types of links. When we're talking about animal abuse and violence against women, um, as I mentioned before, these emotional bonds, and it's not just pets, it also involves caring for the farm animals. It keeps the women and children from escaping. The children in these homes hurt or kill animals because this is what they see the adults in the family doing. And there are many reasons why she doesn't leave and she blames herself and she says it was my fault and we need to tell her no. This is a wake-up call. If he's hurting harmless animals, it's not your fault, it's his fault and you and the children need to make plans to get out of there and bring your pets with you. That creates a problem because very few animal, uh, very few domestic violence shelters accept pets. We're working on that, and I'll show you how. The animal abuse, child abuse link. Uh, Children committing acts of animal cruelty is one of the earliest indicators of conduct disorder. It starts showing up at about the age of six and a half years old. Sexually abused children have to fear for their pet safety as well. Children who not only commit animal cruelty, but who witness it, are at much greater risk of committing antisocial behaviors, both as children and then later as adolescents and into adulthood. It's linked with bullying. And it's not only youths who bully others who you would expect to be more aggressive towards animals, but youths who have been bullied transfer that negative energy that's been directed at them against animals uh, as well. Victimized children may take their aggression out on animals or hurt animals to reenact the abuse that's been uh, aimed at them. Child welfare workers rarely look to see if there are dangerous animals in the child's home. 
They're supposed to look at the child's environment as a safe environment and it never occurs to them that this dog or some other animal might be dangerous. I know of at least four cases in the U.S. and Canada where children whose families were being investigated by the child welfare agencies were killed by pet snakes. And it never occurs to the child welfare agencies that this could be a risk to the child. We have the issue of children who attend dog fights and cock fights. And in, this, in these homes where there is all this chaos and fighting going on, that pet may be the only anchor, the only uh, sign of stability, the only comfort, the only emotional support that, that child knows. Many people in the popular media say, oh, every ch child who starts her out, every serial killer started out killing animals. That's not true, okay? The best estimates we have right now is that about 10% of the school shooters and the mass shooters and the serial killers started out killing animals, about 10%. That's still a very large percentage, but it's not all of them. Not all childhood animal abusers grow up to become psychopaths, and in fact, some children who are surrounded by violence seek comfort in their animals and try to protect them. But childhood animal abuse is extremely important warning and a, and a red flag that we need to address this and give that child extra attention. We've identified seven major areas where animal abuse and elder abuse come together. The first is the case where the pets are neglected. The senior citizens may love their pets dearly, but because of financial limitations, transportation problems, uh, physical uh, limitations, um, they just mental, you know, uh, cognitive or uh, dementia, Alzheimer's. They may forget to feed the animal or they may overfeed it or they may not be able to let the pet out to go to the bathroom and so the house becomes filled with urine and feces or they can't afford veterinary care and the animals are neglected. The flip side of that is self-neglect. They'll take what limited money they have and spend it on their pets but not on themselves. And so they're not getting health care. They refuse to go into a hospital or long-term health care facility um, because there's nobody to care for their animals. Or they'll eat pet food. The emotional attachment that they have towards their pets can be intense. This pet could be the last link to a spouse who passed away. This animal may be the only motivation she has to get up in the morning or the only reason to go outside and, take, and get a walk in. And when that animal passes away, it can be emotionally devastating for the senior citizen. We have the issue of, of uh, adult protective caseworkers or home health aides or anybody else serving these people who are afraid to go into those homes because they're overrun with vermin, uh, because of the dog food tins that have piled up in the sink for weeks at a time or the cat litter box that hasn't been changed in a month and the animals may be dangerous and the case workers may not be pet friendly themselves and so these people are not getting the social services that they so desperately need. We have cases of financial exploitation. Children holding their elderly parents pets hostage for ransom money. Believe it or not, it happens. We have cases where the disabled are very dependent on their service animals and their partner is extremely jealous of the attachment that their spouse or partner has for their uh, service animal. And then the animal hoarding issue, which I said could be any age group, but it tends to be mostly older people. And it's probably an attachment disorder, but it's been linked to many other psychological conditions. And as I said, there is no cure for it yet. So let's look at some new pathways to the future based on this uh, approach of the link. Veterinary medicine plays a major role in this because there's a new public expectation and perception of veterinarians. This, uh, veterinarians are seen as the animal health experts. And because of that, and the growth of veterinary forensics, and we're gonna be talking about uh, forensics later this afternoon, uh, law enforcement agencies are increasingly going to be asking veterinarians to give them information about a case and help them determine what's wrong with an animal and whether a case should be prosecuted. And the public understands this and they're turning to veterinarians. This was a study from the province of Manitoba in Canada. It's a very rural province 
where there are not in the in North America, animal shelters, uh, nonprofit NGO animal shelters are called humane societies, which isn't the same as a British humane society. Two completely different things. Um, but in uh, in this study, they asked people who would they call to report animal abuse, and more people would call their veterinarian than would call the animal shelter or the police department. And we find that over and over again in areas where police or animal shelters just are not functioning well. It has taken an extremely long time in the United States to get veterinarians on board with this, but we're making great progress. Uh, it's taken literally 30 years to get veterinarians in America to first recognize that this is an issue, that animal abuse is something that falls within their responsibility, and then to get the support from the professional organizations. And we now have statements from the American Animal Hospital Association, the American Veterinary Medical Association, the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association, the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons in uh, the UK, and the New Zealand Veterinary Association, encouraging or requiring veterinarians to report suspected animal abuse. We have legislation now that is enabling or requiring that. In our 50 states, we now have 41 of our 50 states in which veterinarians are either mandated, those are the states in blue, or at least permitted to report animal abuse. Those are the states in green. Uh, and in 31 of those states, they have immunity from civil and criminal liability if they make a report in good faith to the appropriate authorities. And in Canada, all the lower tier provinces, veterinarians are required to report suspected abuse because of these new laws. Veterinarians were then saying, but how do I know that it's abuse? How do I diagnose it? And we have tools to do that. We have an emerging field of veterinary forensics. We have lots of literature that's available. Uh, we teach a course online through the University of uh, Florida. Annabella there is one of the people who, who took that course a number of years ago. We have practice management guidelines. I'll give you some larger pictures of these in a little bit that are available. They're free. We have them on our website. You can download them. They're marvelous guidelines for how to handle these issues in a veterinary practice. And then next question is, who is the veterinarian going to call? Believe it or not, in the United States, there are at least 6,500 different phone numbers that somebody should call to report suspected abuse. We do not have a national system for this. We put together the list of who to call across the country, these 6,500 different agencies, so veterinarians now at least know who to call when they see some of these situations. Animal protection is leading a new pathway to the future. And this was a market research study that came out of Canada. And let me read this to you. The philosophy in the animal welfare community is switching to addressing the human problems that underlie crises with animals. Animal shelter service philosophy is evolving to recognize that treating the symptoms of animal welfare problems, such as animal homelessness or abuse and neglect, is only a stopgap solution. To be truly effective, the underlying causes, such as community and family dysfunction, must be addressed. And we're seeing more animal shelters begin to recognize a more holistic view of the fact they're not just dealing with the animal, they're dealing with the entire family. One of the newest areas to get involved with this is the field of social work. And this is a, a huge battle awaiting us. There are 887 schools of social work in the United States, and only 3% of them even mention the fact that their clients might have pets or recognize that the human-animal bond is part of the families that they will be dealing with. We're approaching this from the veterinary perspective. There's a new field called veterinary social work. It comes out of the University of Tennessee. And we're training, veterinary, we're training social workers to work in veterinary hospitals, to work in four major areas that affect veterinary practices, compassion fatigue and conflict management to help veterinarians and their staffs deal with the emotional strain of euthanasia and uh, the challenges of the work they face every day. Veterinary social workers are dealing with animal-assisted therapy, animal-assisted interactions. They're helping clients deal with grief and bereavement when their pets have to be euthanized 
and of course they work on the link between animal abuse and human violence. And we call this the human side of veterinary medicine and the animal side of social work. And it's a marvelous interdisciplinary mix. We're starting to see things like this. There's a, uh, an area in um, social work called a genogram. This is not a genealogy chart. It's a map of the emotional attachments that people in a household have going back three generations. So it shows how children react to their, 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 uh, their ex-father or their uh, mother's boyfriend or the, or the grandmother or whatever. And we're starting to see these genograms start to include animals in the diagrams as well. In the field of law enforcement and criminal justice, we're making major progress on this. Five years ago, our Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, came out with a report that reported that not only is animal abuse a risk for family violence, it is a risk for terrorism, because there have been several instances of terrorists who harmed animals as a warning sign that we had been ignored. We have several levels of crime in America. We have minor offenses, then we have misdemeanors, and then the most serious crimes are called felonies. I don't know what the Portuguese equivalents are. Uh, it used to be in the early 1990s that only five of our 50 states had felony level animal cruelty. Today, all 50 do. At least some crimes are felonies. Realistically speaking, most of these crimes are still only minor offenses or misdemeanors, and enforcement is limited, but we're making progress. We have 60 law, uh, prosecutor's offices and police departments in the country that have specialized task forces working on animal cruelty cases because these cases are complex and there are so many of them. I mentioned sex with animals as being illegal. It's now illegal in 48 of our 50 states. Two of our states still think sex with animals is, is appropriate. Um, but that is a major step forward, and believe me, we're working on those other two states. Starting in 2006, we started seeing a movement for what we call pet protection orders. In a domestic violence case, a judge can issue a protective order for the woman, warning the man to stay away from her and the children and specific conditions. Well, we now have 38 of these states, in, our, in 38 of our states, pets can be included in those protective orders. And sometimes the farm animals are included as well. Major legislative progress there and something I'd like to see in other states. I have been in animal shelters where one party brings the animal in to put it up for adoption so the other party doesn't get it in the divorce settlement. We now have six states, and this is a very new phenomenon, six states in which courts can specifically award custody of pets in a divorce settlement based on the animal's best interests, similar to the child's best interests in a child custody case. That is a major new development. And we now have 12 states in which an act of domestic violence, I'm sorry, an act of animal cruelty intended to intimidate somebody in domestic violence is also defined as an act of domestic violence. So it can be prosecuted as either domestic violence or animal cruelty or both. And so some major legislative changes there. We're very excited about that. We're seeing some major new pathways forward in this link with domestic violence, violence against women. We have about 250 of our domestic violence shelters in the US are now pet friendly out of about 3,000 women's shelter. So we still have a long way to go, uh, but there is a pet-friendly shelter in almost every state now. The resource for this is a program called Sheltering Animals and Families Together, safetyprogram.org. My colleague, Ali Phillips, uh, created this program a number of years ago, and there's money available for it from the pet food companies, from the federal government, and from nonprofit NGO organizations. A uh, great program is uh, called Red Rover. They're working in this. And we have three websites now where somebody who needs to escape domestic violence can go online and find either a pet-friendly shelter or at least a domestic violence shelter that has an arrangement with uh, veterinarians or animal shelters in the community to provide foster care for the pets. 
In domestic violence, there's a process called safety planning, where the shelters train women to have everything they need to be able to escape at a moment's notice when they have just a very few minutes to get away, and we're including pets in those safety planning materials. We have samples of all of those on our website as well. But there are still a lot of gaps in the system. We still have a long way to go. As I mentioned, social workers um, are not receiving training either in college or in continuing education about the human-animal bond. We would like to see more social workers getting this type of training. We need to train veterinarians not only to respond to uh, animal abuse, but also domestic violence. Because an increasing number of veterinarians are women, most of the clients coming into veterinarians' offices are women, and it is a one health, one welfare issue. Scotland and New Zealand are leading the way uh, in that area, and both of those governments have addressed the domestic violence component for veterinarians. We should be having domestic violence agencies and women's shelters routinely ask questions on the crisis lines and the hotlines to find out whether there are any animals at home and whether they need protection as well, and include them in the assessments and the interviews and the, the screening processes. We need to have better cross-training and referrals between human services and animal service agencies so that they talk to each other and establish a line of communication so when either agency sees a problem on the other side, they know who to call and they can make a referral. We need more pet-friendly women's shelters and we need more pet-friendly shelters for the homeless populations as well. And in the child protection field, they use a model that's called ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. And that was a, ma a major study that was done by our national health agency years ago, looking at how adverse traumas in childhood cause lifelong, not only emotional and psychological problems, but cause people to adopt risky health behaviors, and they get sicker sooner and they die earlier. They forgot to include childhood exposure to animal cruelty as an adverse childhood experience because, of course, it's only an animal. We need to get the childhood, child prevention people to recognize animal cruelty is an adverse childhood experience. The link offers all of us a way forward. We can stay on our own area and mark our own turf and just forget about the rest of the world. Okay? We can continue working in silos and have human services say, hey, I don't care about animals, it's not in my mandate, and animal shelters saying, oh, I help animals, I don't help people, or law enforcement saying, I help people, I don't help animals. Or we can all go to the doggy park and play together. And we can all recognize that by working together, we can increase our power for making legislative change and long-term systemic change. We can pool our resources we can reduce duplication, we can create healthier and safer communities. Jennifer Wolf is one of the new breed of forensic veterinarians. She's in California, and I love her quote. She says, animal abuse is the abused canary in the coal mine. The canary in the coal mine of an abusive home may literally be an abused canary. By responding to the injury or death of that canary, we can potentially save many other pets and people. Or as the Milwaukee program says, if you call to report either animal abuse or human abuse, you may not save just one life, you may save two. For more information, Laurentina and her people are doing a marvelous job of translating this into Portuguese. We're a little bit behind schedule on it, but it will be coming. And Laurentina is giving the details on this. I wrote this for the Latham Foundation a number of years ago. There's a lot of material out there, a lot of resources. We have all of that on our website, and it's free uh, for the taking. So visit our website, nationallinkcoalition.org. Um, we have uh, these veterinary manuals. I'll be talking more about the veterinary side uh, this afternoon. We have our free monthly link letter. Feel free to email me. Of course, I'll be around all day for your questions. And I don't know, do we want to take questions and answers now, Laurentina, are we behind schedule? I try.
I don't, oh, it's, it's working. Uh, thank you, Dr. Akro, for your brilliant uh, presentation. Uh, I would have a, a question. Um, so we are talking about uh, uh, the violence against pets in a domestic context, uh, but what do you think about um, the exposition of a child to uh, other uh, animal abuse uh, in cultural contexts, such as bullfighting, for example? Uh, because this is a major issue now in our society uh, because the, the Committee for the, the Child Rights of UNESCO uh, has uh, asked Portugal to diminish the, the age to, uh, be, to uh, assist to bullfighting. And Portugal is always resisting to, to this reduction. Now we are at 16. But what do you think? Uh, do you think that child who will go with, their, with, with family to bullfighting uh, will be uh, uh, psychologically um, affected by visualizing this, this kind of, of animal abuse, because it's an animal abuse. Thank you. An excellent question. First of all, bullfights are cruel. And, <laughs> and full stop, OK? Uh, and there's absolutely no reason why uh, children should be exposed to that, or for that matter, adults should be exposed to it. Um, and I know a number of areas have tried to ban bullfighting. Barcelona, I believe, has made progress in that area. But it's an issue in Latin America, Spain, Portugal, and, and elsewhere as well. Should children be exposed to that? No. I don't know of any research that shows uh, whether there is lifelong psychological damage to children from going to bullfights. Maybe there is. If not, we certainly need research in that area. Um, and our attitude towards uh, that and many other similar issues, whether it's dogfighting or cockfighting and other challenges, is that somebody's culture is no excuse for animal cruelty. And trying to justify animal cruelty as a cultural tradition just doesn't work. Okay? Cruelty is cruelty. Okay? The reality is that there are different standards. If beauty is in the eye of the beholder, so is cruelty. And what farmers think is cruel and what an animal rights activist think are cruel are two completely different standards. And it's only when a society reaches a consensus that that kind of change occurs. So there will always be things on the margin and things that society just hasn't come to grips with yet. But something as clear cut as bullfighting, you know, as perfect. But then I'm coming from an American standard where all I know about bullfighting is what Ernest Hemingway wrote. <laughs> Okay, um, but yeah, I don't think children should go at all. Thank you. Okay. Right. We're done? Okay. Thank you. Obrigada. Thank you very much. Yet a, a, another sign of all the stuff that we still need to do although today we are talking about domestic animals but just this just goes to show how deep these matters are and as phil says it's very good to have scientific studies that give us some support to the topics we're debating here many studies uh, prove the relationship between um, animal abuse and domestic violence having said this i will pass the floor uh, I uh, will introduce our next speaker, uh, Giselle uh, Schaefer is going to talk about animal abuse in Brazil and its close connection with domestic violence within the uh, country. Giselle is also a uh, veterinarian and a master uh, in animal law and society from the University of Barcelona. She's also specialized in pharmacology and therapeutics, research in the research group on animal law at the Federal University of Santa Maria in Brazil. She's the author of many books and papers related to animal law. Her research line is animal abuse from the perspective of criminology. Giselle, you have the floor.
Good morning. Good morning to all. Can you all hear me loud and clear? I'd like to begin by saying that it's an honor for me to be here participating at this extremely important event with researchers who I admire, such as uh, Professor Phil. I would also like to thank Laurentina Pedroso, uh, our animal uh, ombudsperson, for the invitation to be here. I will be talking a bit about the abuse towards animals in Brazil and the close uh, link and connection with domestic violence. I will be showing you uh, some of the uh, results of an experiment which I conducted and also when it comes to uh, what are the main animals, uh, victims in, within this context. So just to give you some initial data on Brazil, we have 214.7 million inhabitants, statistics from the IBGE dating 2022. In terms of household pets, 139.3 million of these 54.2 dogs, 39.8 birds and 23.9 cats amongst others. When it comes to animals that have been abandoned, according to the WHO, 30 million uh, animals have been abandoned in Brazil, a, high, a very high number of which 20 million are dogs, 10 million are cats. Starting with an insight into our federal law on animal protection, so we have federal, state and municipal legal frameworks. I will only be talking about the federal law and this includes the Magna Charta which mentions in Article 20, 225, it states that it's up to the public to protect fauna and flora and all practices which subject any of these to uh, abuse are uh, forbidden. Then we have uh, the environmental crime law. Article 32 states that practicing abuse, ill treatment, wounding or mutilating animals, be them wild, domestic or domesticated, native or exotic, leads to a three months to a, a year imprisonment and fine. In 2020, an update states that when we're dealing with dog or cat, this penalty will uh, amount to a two to five year imprisonment and a fine. Just to state that for cats, this has been increased. And why? Because there was a very well known case in Brazil of a cat called Samson and he, uh, of a, a, a dog called Samson, and he led to this alteration to the um, penalties and fines for uh, towards cats and dogs. As you were able to see before, on uh, Article 32 on environmental crimes, what we have here is just a statement of ill treatment and the veterinary association in Brazil defined through a new resolution what are cruelty, ill treatment and abuse towards animals and also addressed and put forth new assumptions and 
characterizations of what is abuse or ill treatment. And now, legally, from a legal standpoint, this list is taken into account when deciding on a case within Brazilian uh, courts. So what do we have in Brazil? We have a traditional legal doctrine where animals are still considered object, therefore not victims. However, we do see some progress because in animal law doctrine, a lot of progress has been made. We have a reassignment from a legal standpoint, and animals are being seen as passive, passive crime victims. But we still have this traditional thought where animals are considered as objects of crime, but we also are working hard, hard on making them considered to be considered victims of crime. So I'd like to talk to you about a research that I conducted. Questionna questionnaires were sent out to around 6,000 veterinarians and these were available from 2019 to 2020, sent out to all veterinarians in Brazil. We received 1,275 questionnaires, of which 1,248 were deemed valid, and I will give you some results of this study. So here we have the map of Brazil. These uh, were the regions where the questionnaires were received from. So we see here 599 responses from veterinarian doctors, but as you can also see, we got feedback from throughout the country. What are the animals that are more often subject to abuse? So we're talking about household pets. The closer they are to humans, the more they are victims and suffer abuse. But 38.4% amount to stray animals and then 4.1% animals that are going to be slaughtered. So what is the classification of the abused animals? Most are uh, household pets, as I said, the ones which live closest to humans. But then we have the domesticated ones, 11.9%, but no doubt, 85.1% amount to the household pets, according to the uh, veterinarians who answered the questionnaire. What are the most prevalent cases of abuse? So what I saw in my own experience it is also what the veterinarians could uh, signal. So the first one is depriving a pet from veterinary care, 72%, followed by beatings, deprivation from water and food, so these were the three most pointed out by the veterinarians, although all of the different uh, potential abuse listed was also selected out of all of the questionnaires. Here we have a traction animal. So these Cart uh, horses or mules are frequently seen throughout the country. Some municipalities 
states have already banned them, especially in urban areas, but in more rural areas they continue to be widely used. And um, these uh, equidae tend to be uh, victims of abuse. When it comes to the gender of the aggressor, most people who are aggressors are men, 81.3%, within the ages of 20 and 40, according to the uh, veterinarians interviewed. This is a graph on the proportional percentage of occurrences of abuse comparing the female and male genders. In relation to this proportional analysis, we can see that people uh, of the male gender are frequently seen causing bodily harm of a greater extent and it's inverse it's uh, proportionally opposite to the kind of uh, abuse perpetrated by females 74.9 percent of vets stated that negligence or ignoring animal welfare is the main cause, followed by stating that uh, the cause of abuse was as a result of a disobedient animal. But what does this really mean? And then we have uh, threat by the animal, a family feud or fight, which also comes into play. Now, talking now a little bit more about the detail of the abuse and the relationship with domestic violence. In Brazil, we have law number 11.340 of 2006, which is called the Maria da Penha Law. Who was Maria da Penha? She suffered dom from domestic violence in the 80s. In 1983, uh, she was shot by her husband and became paraplegic. So she took a while before uh, she actually denounced this abuse and he was convicted for his crimes and Brazil at the time had to redraft its laws to address these cases because the conviction did not address the severity of the situation and the law therefore had to be changed. So this uh, law intends to prevent or stop any violence enacted towards uh, women and family members within the, the household and it protects against physical, moral, psychological and sexual abuse. In the Maria de Peña law we have protective measures. And these are the legal mechanisms for people who are at risk, aiming towards preserving physical and mental health of victims. This is requested by uh, the victims and expedited by uh, the justice system. So we have two protective emergency measures which uh, act on the aggressor and protect women. Examples of this uh, protection are police escort for a woman to be able to collect her personal possessions uh, from the house she wants to leave. Also escorting her and her children uh, to the shelters. 
There are there is however no reference to an escort provided for animals which is something lacking in Brazil. Now data on uh, domestic violence. Uh, 38,000 uh, women are victims on a daily basis and basis and uh, the aggressors are their husbands and or ex-husbands or partners and 18,000 children are uh, victims every day. Some data that we got access to, to during the pandemic, there was this uh, research uh, where animals affected by um, the lockdown as well. Yes, uh, because they spent more time with their aggressor. One to uh, four, one in four women was victim of some kind of violence domestic during the pandemic. The um, perpetrators were the uh, former partners, uh, husbands, um, uh, partners uh, in Sao Paulo, for instance. 50,000 human asked for protective measures against the domestic violence. With uh, regards to the uh, sheltering of women, once again we have data from Statistic Brazil and 2.4% uh, of uh, Brazilian municipalities have shelter homes. 8.3% of the municipalities uh, have uh, uh, police departments with uh, with special plans to, to, to care for women. 5.3% uh, have a municipal um, plan uh, f with uh, policies specially designed for women. And um, 1,221 uh, women and uh, 1,103 children uh, were um, welcomed to uh, shelter homes in during this uh, period. There is nothing mentioned vis-à-vis -vis, uh, animals. In Brazil we have a uh, few researchers that speak about the relationship between uh, women and uh, animals that were victim of abuse. Uh, the first researcher was Maria uh, José Pandilha, so this was done in uh, 2011, so in Brazil we running very much behind schedule, um, and uh, this was in the uh, state of Pernambuco, in the northeast of Brazil. Uh, interviews were conducted uh, with 453 uh, women. Um, there was a questionnaire that was put to them, and the result was that 51% of the cases of um, household pets or other uh, animals had already been uh, subject to abuse by perpetrators, and 79% of the perpetrators were over 30 years old. Uh, and there are um, cases of, uh, w there was this case of one uh, woman that was diagnosed with a sexually transmitted disease because the husband had uh, intercourse with the dog of the family. Um, another uh, research that was done at municipal level um, by Adriana Gil. This was done in Suzanne, where uh, 57 women uh, that uh, um, complained to uh, the uh, police were questioned. Uh, 37 women had a pet, and of these, 47% reported um, abuse of uh, animals. 20% um, complained about aggressiveness of uh, the perpetrated with third um, entities, uh, third-party animals. Um, some of these uh, women uh, also included observations such as it, he has uh, he killed uh, a dog or he has killed two dogs and uh, hurt uh, a cat. Another research was done by Liza Gomes uh, between uh, November 2019 and February 2020 uh, at Belo Horizonte. She um, interviewed 352 women that were victims of domestic violence. Um, a questionnaire was uh, 
uh, put to them and the result was that 22% of the animals of the victims had already been subject to um, abuse of, uh, by the perpetrators. The main um, authors of the violence were the uh, husband or um, boyfriend of victims. And last, a uh, research on domestic violence by uh, Marcelo Massaro, conducted between uh, 2010 and 2012. Uh, 643 interventions of uh, police were analyzed uh, concerning uh, animal abuse, and he got to the conclusion that the uh, average profile of the aggressor uh, is 90% are men. Uh, with an average uh, age of 43%, uh, so, uh, with an average of 43 years of age, the majority of cases, 73%, involved domestic animals. Um, the list of uh, victims were um, uh, cocks due to uh, cockfights, and then. Uh, cats and other uh, birds and, and uh, horses. Alternatives that we have to minimize this problem. Now the first one is public policies that are efficient, uh, that raise awareness uh, with regards to the protection of animal uh, victims, not only human victims of uh, um, domestic violence. These need to guarantee the dignity and uh, public safety. For instance, the shelters for um, women should also accept that their pets. Uh, raising awareness uh, among the public on uh, domestic violence, specific uh, approaches in to this topic in in schools for instance this is something that is not done in the uh, legal and veterinary schools uh, students need to understand that there is this link this connection between uh, domestic violence and uh, violence against animals uh, um, pro uh, training in at universities, uh, promoting uh, programs, uh, training programs outside universities, uh, the training of professionals, for instance, social workers and uh, uh, members of the police forces, uh, and uh, the inclusion of, uh, uh, of, of prescriptions in the legislation that deal with domestic uh, violence. One example that we have in Brazil is the uh, shelter for uh, this shelter for um, Brazilian uh, women. This is in Curitiba. This was started in uh, June uh, 2016. This is open 24 hours a day, and they um, have received 44,000 uh, women that have been uh, victims of uh, domestic violence. Victims can take with them, besides children, their animals, their pets without restriction uh, if they have for instance five pets and if they decide to um, leave their home they can take their pets uh, with uh, with her to this house animals are accepted since 2019 and uh, uh, transportation is provided uh, by the municipal police or other police forces. If uh, a woman decided to um, leave uh, her residence uh, but uh, the pet is still there, um, the pet can uh, later on be um, collected. The average of uh, animals received is 40 to 50 every month. Um, and the house offers uh, food, water, and an adequate place for the pets. But if required, they can um, uh, be together with the um, pets. Live with uh, sorry, live. With, the pets can live with the the women. Now this house uh, exists in seven states, but it is only in Curitiba that uh, animals are uh, welcome.
uh, therefore we still have a long way to go in Brazil and I'd like to say that uh, pets are still invisible uh, when it comes to domestic violence and uh, we need to do uh, something uh, to change this. Thank you very much. This is, uh, these are my contacts uh, and I will be at your disposal. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry. We now have some time for questions, at least 10 minutes, and uh, we can actually put questions to you, Giselle, and uh, maybe any uh, other question if it feels so. I'd like to give the floor to uh, the audience, uh, especially those that are familiar with the Portuguese legislation. Any comment from you, anything you would like uh, to um, debate, differences between the two countries and this evolution that was mentioned here? Well, good morning. I also come from Brazil, but I've been living in Portugal for almost 30 years now. I would like to ask you, with uh, regards to having uh, pets in municipal uh, shelters, how how does that work? Well, they're always uh, full, I'm afraid. Uh, this is a reality. I don't see any uh, progress in this. I live in Porto Alegre, Rio Grande do Sul, and in the municipality we have 150 animals uh, in shelters and we have no other shelters for animals. So we have this uh, um, problem of not having uh, public policies that are efficient uh, uh, people don't do not castrate the animals in Brazil and we do not have room for all the animals we will never have enough room if we cannot uh, implement public policies that uh, have to do with the castration of animals environmental education this is a problem in Brazil the issue of uh, shelters for animals we still have lots of stray animals that is uh, prescribed in the legislation municipalities or the state i don't i'm not uh, saying at uh, federal level but at municipal level is it compulsory for the municipalities to to have those shelters it is not compulsory but most of the municipalities have these uh, shelters for animals uh, where animals uh, stay until they are adopted uh, but I believe that some municipalities do not really have shelters I'd like to put a question to you Gisela and uh, once again we are here speaking mostly of pets but for many people you know horses are also pets and we saw here some uh, pictures and Brazil has a reality in terms of these animals that has been studied uh, uh, would you like to make uh, any comment with because of the situation of horses and the the welfare we're still uh, trying to uh, fight in order to for the legislator to consider um, horses as as pets uh, and uh, not uh, be part of uh, whenever certain situations are detected and there is the intervention of authorities they should not um, be part of they should not go to the slaughterhouse and should be also uh, welcomed uh, in a shelter I think that in many countries they are considered uh, animals that are closer to men and, 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 and pets Yes, in Brazil we have many horses that are well, well taken care of, you know, those that are used for sports. But as I showed in the photographs, uh, we have lots of uh, traction horses that pull carts, and that's the worst problem that we have in Brazil with regards to horses, because uh, we do not have a legislation that allows us to actually collect those uh, horses and uh, uh, 
put them in a shelter because they uh, provide for several people. They collect uh, waste, uh, recyc recyclable waste uh, uh, is collected by those uh, the people that own those those cards. And uh, um, what we need to do is to have public policies so that those people that that use horses these days can have uh, another way uh, to 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 go about their their, their daily activities so um, uh, these days you know we are implementing we, we have schemes so that uh, um, horses are no longer used for these kind of uh, work and uh, these people will continue to work uh, via other alternatives so that means that you're studying you know alternatives to people that are in these situations and that uh, need to have a certain you know framework uh, in this area yes it's also uh, the link i mean uh, with regards to, to to horses i'd like to ask a question to phil i'd like to put that question in english uh, Related with this, Giselle, you can stay here, okay. informal. We don't go to the table, okay. we didn't go before. Uh, it was also related with uh, I, what I asked to Giselle, because in the United States, yes, uh, horses sometimes are considered a pet, and they also can be abused. How do you, do you what do you think about it, and what can we do better with, with it? Most of the research in the U.S. has involved companion animals. We have very little research on livestock, or horses in particular. It's, a, it's an area that needs uh, additional study. Um, one of the uh, approaches I take when I'm talking to uh, lawyers and, and prosecutors is I show them a picture of a duck. And I don't know whether this translates well into Portuguese or not, but um, there's an expression in English that says, if it walks like a duck and, t and looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, what is it? Well, the obvious answer is it's a duck. But under American law, it could be treated as a pet duck. It could be treated as a wild duck. It could be treated as a commercial livestock farm animal commodity duck. And, and there are three different sets of laws and three different agencies that might investigate it. Horses are the same way. They could be wild. They could be farm animals. They could be somebody's close companion. And depending on uh, the jurisdiction, there may, may be different sets of laws. From the domestic violence standpoint, we're seeing more shelters that accept dogs and cats and small companion animals. But what happens when she comes in with a horse or a llama <laughs> or a snake <laughs> or other animals that, of course, people are you know, attached to? And of course, the facilities for those that followed me also mentioned about this. Uh, so we're speaking about a multidisciplinary situation, and we're speaking about multi-species. And within the animal species, we also have the human species. We're trying to make this link. Uh, all uh, of these species need to be protected, but the threat that unites all these species is that, you know, the abuse inflicted to animals can in fact affect a human being. And we need to uh, link to this, uh, um, you know, help provided to animals, both animals and people, and working uh, in a team and uh, all the effort that we may uh, in fact uh, do as scientists, uh, uh, teachers and entities of the state uh, is very important. I have a question, Portuguese Association to the, for, that provides support to the victims. Well, for your this, uh, speech was really interesting. Uma, uma, um, um que não é assim tanto, um pormenor quando uh, não tanto. A detail, uh, not exactly uh, in, in their homes, but uh, when they go to the shelter, uh, I mean, the, the women in Brazil, how do you integrate, you know, the animals that are already there and uh, um, animals that are newcomers? Uh, do you have any protocol? And, and, and Phil, this is a question for you as well. Uh, with regards to uh, quarantine or something like that? 
Yes, a quarantine. Do you have a specific protocol in that uh, animal shelter to integrate animals and uh, to establish relationship between the different animals? Well, we do not have a specific protocol and in fact we have very few shelters that uh, welcome those animals and those uh, women. So. Uh, there are lots of uh, norms, I believe, that we need to create. So we do not have a protocol uh, in, 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 in those shelters. Uh, Phil mentioned that there are several shelters in the United States. We have maybe, uh, we have one at least, or maybe two in Brazil. So um, it, this is, uh, uh, means a very uh, small number. But we do need to establish those protocols. In the afternoon, we will be speaking about shelters uh, for domestic uh, violence that we have in Portugal. And we already have the possibility of uh, uh, women uh, actually taking their uh, pets with them. And we need to establish the connection between ideas, the practical uh, ideas and the practice. I mentioned in my uh, presentation the uh, sheltering Animals and Families Together program, safetyprogram.org. Allie Phillips has written a manual uh, that's available. It's on our website. It's on her website with protocols for, uh, with four different models for adding animal uh, handling uh, capabilities at women's shelters. It's a difficult process uh, because of allergies, uh, fear of people getting bitten, not everybody in the shelter likes animals. Um, what species can you take? The physical limitations. The neighbors might complain. Uh, the shelters try to keep their location secret so nobody knows where they are, so they can't publicize the, uh, either their location. And they also do, don't, often don't publicize that they accept pets because they don't want to be overwhelmed with too many animals. So there are a lot of issues, but the fact that we have 250 shelters now in the U.S. and many more in the U.K., Spain, Australia, and the Netherlands means it can be done. Um, and we have models for those different protocols, which I'm sure could be adapted to Portugal. Thank you, Phil. Thank you very much, uh, Phil. Um, and we will have the uh, our coffee break, and we'll be back in uh, half an hour for a second session. Thank you very much.
Um, back uh, and to the second session for this morning. I am going to introduce our colleague Elizabeth Umerod who um, had a slight constraint so we're going to have a bit of a challenge here for this session and fortunately she had a uh, personal constraint. Her husband unfortunately is poorly we hope that uh, uh, he uh, gets better soon. So Elizabeth will be joining us, but via Zoom. So she will be talking to us from the UK. And I believe she is here with us now. Yes, <laughs> we can see you well. <clears throat> Elizabeth, vai falar. Elizabeth will be talking about the link between animal abuse and human violence experiences from Europe, UK, Sweden, the Netherlands, where these topics have already been uh, worked on for longer, and also talking to us about a pathway to preventing future violence. Elizabeth is also a veterinarian. She's also the uh, chairwoman of the Society for Companion Animal Studies and is Vice President for Membership of the International Association of Human Animal Interaction Organizations. Uh, she has done a lot of work both in the UK and internationally. She has assisted in introducing very many programs connected to this topic at various levels and she also has uh, an award uh, 
the uh, William F. McCullough Award for Excellence in Human-Animal Interaction Practice and Education. And uh, now uh, you will be the, the, I'll lead you to, the, to, the, to your talk. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be um, here virtually um, to address this important meeting. Um, I should have been with you in person, but um, family circumstances dictate that I couldn't leave Scotland. So this is a really important subject. It's a difficult subject. Um, it's one that all of us who work with people or animals or both should understand. We should be well versed in this and understand what to do should we come across suspicion. This presentation uh, has arisen out of work that I've done with Brinda Jagathiesen, Marion C. Enders Leckers, and Paula Bodden. And information about their backgrounds is within the, the slideshow. I'm going to start with a historical perspective of some key um, milestones in the UK and the USA. I'll introduce Bronfenbrenner's bioecological systems model for studying this, um, illustrated with some case studies. I'll give a veterinary perspective of the links with pointers to non-accidental injury and advice on how we should respond to suspect cases and highlight the importance of a transdisciplinary approach to this and finally give some pathways to prevention. So here are some milestones. Now it's interesting, in Britain, the Royal Society for Protection of Cruelty to Animals was founded some 60 years before the National Society for the Protection of Cruelty to Children. Um, we had some studies in the 80s that highlighted the links, both in the UK and in the USA. In 2001, Helen Monroe, a Scottish veterinary pathologist, authored The Battered Pet, which mirrored um, The Battered Child, which had been published earlier in the States. In 2004, the Lynx Group introduced training on the Lynx to veterinary undergraduates, and that continues to this day. And Rand and Henelman, Henel and Monroe, both veterinary pathologists, um, published a book on forensic veterinary pathology, animal abuse and unlawful killing in 2008. Recently, my colleagues and I applied Bronfenbrenner's bioecological bio systems model to looking at cases that we had been involved with in the link. And we feel that by using this method, especially people that are new to the link might have a, a better understanding of why a holistic approach is needed. Bronfenbrenner's work is well known to social workers, so I think that they especially will benefit enormously from applying this. Bronfenbrenner stated that child development particularly is dependent on a number of influential factors and these can be viewed in concentric spheres of widening influence. Um, once you understand this, it, it does make um, interpretation of these cases easier. So this is a, a model using the human-animal bond and the different spheres. So the immediate family, then the wider connection like the school, the neighbourhood, um, what services there are in an area, and then government systems, laws, policies, politics, economics, religious beliefs, and cultural values. And overlaying on this is a chrono system. So what happens to an individual at a particular time in their life? how something will affect them differently at different ages. So the first case is a tragic case of, first of all, a puppy 
being thrown down the stairs by a young man. The puppy was taken into um, animal welfare care. Shortly after that, the young couple had a baby. And very soon after that, the same young man who had thrown the puppy down the stairs killed his young son by throwing him stairs. So with hindsight, a situation like this, you might, if you were, if the case had been um, cross reported, then social services may have been able to prevent the death of the child. And this is it demonstrated in the, the Bronf, using bon, Bronfenbrenner's approach. And you can see the similarities. Puppies are vulnerable. Young children are vulnerable. Um, those of us who work in veterinary medicine, they're not surprised to see things like this. This is a case in the, the Netherlands where a young man killed a kitten and did not, um, there were no repercussions at that time. He went on to become a very violent man. Uh, he beat up his ex-wife and threatened to beat the child. And with hindsight, that young man should have been put into a programme. People who harm animals are at risk of their behaviour escalating and they need help. So this again is the this case illustrated and how this uh, violence has developed over time. We often find that if we start to alert people to the link in an animal in a country where this has not um, hitherto been studied, there can be a rejection of the notion. Oh no, this doesn't happen here. We don't we don't do this. Um, but when the research is conducted, um, it's just very similar. We see the parallels across countries. So this is research conducted by Mario Z in the Netherlands. Um, highlighting issues and that people postpone leaving the partners because they cannot get the pets into a safe haven. In the UK, we have examples of animal abuse as a precursor to murder. Um, young people having a history of animal cruelty and then progressing to much more serious heinous offences, including murder. And actually this morning, the big news is that uh, a 14 year old boy killed his five year old stepbrother recently. Um, that boy had been torturing animals before he killed his little brother, his little stepbrother. Um, again, that, that child should have been taken into an intervention. Children that harm animals are themselves deeply troubled. So most children that harm animals do not go on to become killers. We must keep that in mind as well. This is a case that I was involved in. I was on emergency call for three veterinary practices and was called to a house early one morning to attend a dog that was already under the care of another vet practice for the symptoms that it was showing through that night. Sarah had been awoken by her dog Kerry screaming. She'd been in bed, her husband was downstairs with Kerry and he told Sarah that Kerry had fallen off his settee. I called I had to travel a long distance through the very early morning to get there and found that Kerry had sublumbar pain, but she'd only fallen off a low settee onto a carpeted floor. It didn't make sense. And she had been attending her own veterinarian regularly for recurrent pain. And the veterinarian had been unable to determine what had been causing the pain. 
I noticed that Sarah was dishevelled while her husband was very smartly groomed and aloof. And then something fell from Sarah landing close by me. I returned it to her. It was a urinary collection bag. I had a light bulb moment. Was this a case of domestic violence against Sarah and Kerry? When her husband left the room, I gave Sarah my private phone number and mouthed. Sarah phoned me that afternoon and said, you know, don't you? She confided that she'd been repeatedly attacked over many years. She had lost one kidney and the other was now badly damaged. No one had ever questioned her about her injuries when she'd been admitted to hospital. I urged her to leave her husband. She said she couldn't because she'd taken wedding vows. But I explained that her husband would kill both her and Kerry and Kerry hadn't taken any vows and she was responsible for Kerry. But Sarah also knew that none of the women's refugees in the UK at that time permitted pets. But I was in touch with a local charity that provided safe haven care for pets of people fleeing domestic violence. And the arrangements were made to pass Kerry into that charity was the kids and Sarah was moved to a safe house. The veterinarian who was their own vet could, he was astonished. He said that um, Sarah's husband was always very concerned and attentive when he attended with Sarah and Kerry to the appointments. But this is just one of the ways that perpetrators control their wives. Look what I did to your dog and the vet doesn't know, and I can do the same to you, and nobody will believe you. But nobody had ever asked her. So this is the um, ecological diagram for this case. And it shows that the responder to get help doesn't always have to be somebody in human health or social care. So in this case, I, as a veterinarian, got Sarah with Kerry to safety. Um, we also get human health and social care professionals sometimes saying, our work is with people, why should we care about animal abuse? That's not our area. That's not our remit. But by this better understanding, it's an extra tool in the toolkit to pick up cases more early to prevent abuse and tragedies from happening. In this case, it illustrates why cross-reporting is really important. So this was a case of a boy beating a puppy. The neighbour reported this to the police. The police arrived and found that the little boy was being seriously abused by his parents. So the boy was acting at what he's, he'd seen perpetrated on himself. The boy was placed in foster care and the dog was placed in animal welfare. These are red flags for, for vet practices. People that attend different practices, give different history, the injuries inconsistent with the history. Animals are reported to fall. Animals rarely fall. Um, delays in presentation. The perpetrator's behaviour can vary enormously. Repetitive injuries. Other family animals having incidents of injuries. High turnover of animals. Animals going missing. I'll not go through all of these because you can read these later, but we have to be very, very careful and methodical and take good records and interview each of our staff members that had any interaction with a family that we have concerned about. Check our old records of all the animals owned and previously owned by the family. 
and sometimes I will go to the house um, just to get a feel of family dynamics and interactions with the pets. Um, I created a community transdisciplinary team and for my practice and I would approach them in any situation where I was worried about a client and their family. And I could do that without breaking client confidentiality. I would just share the scenario and then they'd give me advice and tell me what more I could do, where I could refer them. When deliberate neg neglect and non accidental injury are expected, we should inform the SPC and or the police. And in Britain, in cases of suspected sexual abuse, these cases must be reported to the police. And we don't require evidence of abuse before reporting, it's suspicious that we report. We see many cases of unintentional neglect arising from ignorance and incapacity of owners. And this is something that we can address through practice. And in these genuine cases, people are they're quite keen to be supported and to get support from the practice and or from clients who can help with things, pet care, like dog walking. And we enroll these clients to come to the practice for education on how to care for the pets, and we don't charge them. If we have clients that want to relinquish the pets, we would um, set up and sign over into the practice. They'd sign a document to say they become the guardian, and then we would adopt the clients out to keep the owners. Recently, veterinary social work is recognised, and that's very welcome. And we have this organisation that's working in the southeast of England, providing support to vulnerable people and the pets. And they've given you the website. We have six havens throughout uh, the UK, but not in these areas currently that are shaded in grey. And we need to address this. And we, we don't have them in Northern Ireland either. And the, the biggest service is provided by Dogs Trust, the biggest dog welfare charity in Britain. So pathways to prevention. Well, first and foremost, training and education about the links for under and postgraduates for all in the health, social care and care sectors and in the judiciary. This should be done and training should be delivered preferably in joint workshops across the disciplines. Um, in the veterinary schools, it would be really good if undergraduate social workers could be trained alongside undergraduate veterinarians and veterinary nurses and technicians. Um, we should all consider non-accidental injury as a differential and we should be prepared on how to act and not wait until we see the first case. And I strongly suggest getting a network of people from other professions as colleagues. We need to target at-risk individuals and groups. For example, those attending accident and emergency departments in hospital, in antenatal classes and families with young children. And we need to determine what services and provision we have in our communities. What referral services and interventions are available? How long does it take to access them? And do we have safe havens for pets? And these are the professions that should be within the transdisciplinary collaboration. And we can include others such as hairdressers. Hairdressers are being targeted by the Lynx Group in Britain because people confide in hairdressers and they may see the wounds and as I said before, we should develop transdisciplinary community networks with cross-reporting. Cross-reporting is essential, especially for early diagnosis, prevention and treatment. Include veterinarians and animal welfare workers. It can be easier to detect neglect and abuse in animals. I'll just leave you to, to read these reasons. And the FBI is now calling for transdisciplinary approach to tackling animal abuse. 
it is much more effective to work with people in other professions and agencies than to work on our own. And it's also, I can vouch, a lot less stressful. Um, the veterinary profession in the UK has a very high incidence of suicide, three to four times what is found in other professions. And I personally think this is down to us not um, having the skills to work with human related issues. And that's why we need to work with other professions. Also very important, I feel, would be the introduction of humane education and animal assisted interventions as a prevention and as a rehabilitative tool. Humane education encourages understanding of the need for compassion for people, animals, plants and our shared environments. And Animal Assisted Interventions, AAI, is a goal-oriented intervention incorporating animals in health, education and human services, such as social work, for therapeutic gains in humans. Veterinarians should always be involved in these pro programmes to ensure careful animal selection and safe practice. And there is a growing body of research now finding that um, such approaches promote pro-sociality and empathy. Therefore, humane education and carefully planned AAI should be introduced to young offender institutions, prisons, and also in our school system. In the UK, veterinarians are not currently mandated to report abuse, but we are no longer bound by client confidentiality issues. The links group um, brought about this change in our RCVS code of conduct. We can break confidentiality where we have concerns. And again, we're not required to have proof when we report, but we should report our suspicion. The Links Group uh, strategic plan for this decade includes the following. So you can see there's an emphasis on training, for training vets, for training undergraduate vets, um, for training other professions. And to expand the provision of pet fostering services and to set standards for pet foster service care. In the Netherlands, there is training for vet students, forensic veterinarians and animal police, a code of conduct for vets, mandatory reporting of child abuse, interdisciplinary cross-reporting, and more cooperation between the professions. Refuges for pets, and a forensic institute at the University of Utrecht. In Sweden, veterinarians have developed an organisation for the veterinary care victims of domestic violence. They have introduced training for social workers and animal welfare officers on the link, and for undergraduate vets and animal welfare students, and postgrad vet training guidelines. There is cross-reporting, but when Norden reported in 2018, it was not uniform. However, in Vastmanland County, social services alerted in all cases of suspected animal welfare abuse if there is a child at the address. And in this way, they are finding up to 30 children every year who are neglected or abused who would not otherwise have been identified. This is really important. Again, um, research conducted in Sweden showing the extent of domestic violence and the involvement of animals. So I would just like to um, conclude now and reiterate that this presentation is derived from the work of myself and my colleagues. Um, we are two veterinarians and two psychologists, again, illustrating the importance of um, cross-disciplinary work and I'd like to thank you all for attending this conference and hope that you will make good use of the information that you received today and carry this forward into work to make a difference for people and animals. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I was wondering if... Ah, desculpem, eu gostava de perguntar se alguém... Well, I, will, I wonder whether anyone had a question to put to Elizabeth. Yes, we have got a question, Elizabeth. Okay, we'll try to get back to you with it. Uh, hello, dear colleague. Uh, I mean, first of all, thank you for a brilliant presentation in your talk. And uh, we wish well to your husband also. And we are, um, we are very uh, committed to your, with, with you and in this cause. And um, I would like to ask you something I was wondering here as I was hearing you, is about the mandatory report that the colleagues have to do in the UK. Um, does it prevent, the, could it be a way that this prevents the, the abusers to bring uh, to the clinic the animals to get uh, health care? Uh, in fact, could this be a, um, a thing that, uh, prevents um, animals to have uh, proper, proper health care, because if the abuser knows um, that he's going to be reported on, he won't bring the animal. Uh, what is the, the experience in the UK about this issue? Thank you so much. In, in the UK at the present time, we don't have mandatory reporting. We don't have it. So it's down to individual vets to decide if they will report and to whom. Um, there are states in the USA where reporting is mandatory and there are mandatory reportings of suspected child abuse. And I don't know what effect that has had on what people bring cases to veterinarians and medical practices for care. Um, what a lot of people that are abusing animals do is they won't restrict themselves to one practice. If they've got children that are being abused, they don't just take them to one GP practice. They will take them to different accident and emergency centres and hospitals. Um, with people who are abusing animals, they will doctor shop. So in Britain, People can go to any veterinary practice that they want. They don't have to register at a practice and only go to that practice. So they could go to different practices on different occasions where an animal is abused. Mm -hmm. um, I would welcome mandatory reporting. Um, I think a lot of vets are worried about doing it. One of the reasons that they don't report is they, they fear that people in the community won't want to go to their practice because they've reported a client. What I found in my husband and I ran a veterinary practice for 28 years, and we found that people in our community were very, very pleased that we reported cases of abuse to the police and social services. It was, um, it engendered trust and people respected us more because we were willing to address these difficult cases for the benefit of animals and children. So I, I would encourage any veterinarian to be, um, to get involved in these cases and, and do what they can to address situations. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I would like to thank you so much. Wish all the best for your husband with his recovery. And thank you so much for having the courage and the strength due to the situation to be talking to us this morning and sharing your, your uh, experience with, with, with us. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. All the, all the best. Um, thank you again for the invitation. Well, something very interesting this afternoon, we will have doctors, pediatricians that uh, will speak to us how we link these situations and how we can uh, act better, improve 
our intervention so that we can give a voice to victims both animal and humans i would like to move now to the last speaker of uh, this session uh, usually we say the last but not the least because it is very important we uh, will have the opportunity to listen to uh, the portuguese experience uh, the portuguese experience we know that this situation so occur here in Portugal. We are aware of this, but we have not uh, quantified them yet. So I would like to give uh, the uh, floor to the next speaker who will be addressing us on companion animals and domestic violence in Portugal, evidence, connections and challenges. And I will invite, invite the speakers and uh, we will have with us two colleagues uh, both a psychologist. We will have Sofia Neves. She is currently uh, a, a teacher at the University of Mayo, where she teaches psychology and criminology. And I'll shorten the CVs because you will have access to these uh, in the program. And Lois um, Kraye, uh, who is a, a teacher at uh, the Polytechnic University of Mayo. Sofia and Elise. Uh, the floor is yours. Good morning to all. To start off, I'd like to begin by thanking Professor Laurentina the invitation to be here it's with a huge honor and pleasure that we are both here today. I'd also like to start by saying that this study stemmed from the connection and the link in this case between a line of investigation we had at our university trying to understand to what extent could uh, pets and animals in general contribute towards uh, human welfare and another one on the domestic violence. And when we brought these two together, this uh, brought about the role of pets and how pets can be important in uh, approaching the topic of domestic violence. So what are the objectives of this presentation? We want to try and reflect on the impact pets have in welfare. P household pets are an important point in terms of people's well-being and mental state. On the other hand, another objective is to um, s discuss the problem uh, between uh, the relationship between domestic violence and violence against animals and reflect on the challenges of the various uh, protection systems set up for both human victims and uh, pets. Our goals are to reflect on the influence of pets. We, we want to also understand in terms of victims of domestic violence, uh, uh, but also children and the long lasting effects this has. We also want to specify uh, aspects of both human and animal characteristics and the relationship specifics, the relationship between animals and household pets and people is one of friendship. Pets are often considered as a, a, a member of a f the family uh, on the same level as a child and there is also a sense of animals being committed and dedicated to their humans, sometimes even more so than um, other humans. And apart from this emotional availability, There is also an issue pertaining to how much easier it is to establish an emotional relationship with animals. Unlike with humans, the relationship with humans 
has to respect a certain and a series of societal rules and that doesn't happen with animals and with pets the love and the friendship between humans and pets tends to be unconditional often we may fall out with family members other relatives or might uh, get into arguments with animals this doesn't happen and then on the other hand it's also not being afraid of rejection this fear of rejection we can commit to our pets without fearing that they will leave us or abandon us often when we say that till death do us part is often more so and more applicable to our relationship with pets on the other hand also we when we talk about dogs and cats especially not so much fish for instance but when we talk about dogs and cats we're talking about the ability animals have of sensing feelings they can often not only sense feelings but expectations intentions understand our mood and often we have people saying that when I need the most, I don't even have to go and look for my pet because my pet comes to me and gives me what I need. So all of these characteristics make this relationship with between people and pets especially beneficial. I'd now like to highlight some advantages, some benefits uh, within this relationship between pets and people when it comes to people's uh, health, well-being and quality of life. This relationship has many uh, benefits. On the one hand, it encourages responsibility. And often this uh, also conveys a sense of usefulness. So the act and the responsibility to care uh, it also instills compassion and empathy and this compassion and empathy very easily can then uh, be replicated uh, with other humans. Studies have shown that a relationship between humans and pets helps to stimulate self-control, autonomy, loyalty, the sense of belonging, a way of acting out uh, playful rituals and also helps relax people and is a source of distraction. It's also true that despite all of these benefits we cannot obviously prescribe a pet for someone who is not well from a mental health perspective the way in which it can bring advantages is not so much whether we have or don't have a pet but what our relationship with the pet is. If I have a pet chained up in the backyard will not promote the same benefits as having a pet living indoors uh, with which there is a close lovable relationship. This also uh, provides, in terms of this relationship, an emotional support, regulates stress, anxiety, and depressive symptoms. It decreases feelings of loneliness, which can also be very important from a domestic violence perspective. It also helps mitigating uh, loss effects and also seems to have an impact on the progression of emotional, mental, or behavioral problems. So it assists in uh, preventing progression often and according to some studies it also acts as a social facilitator especially for those pets that we can take out for walks and they can be a form of interaction with other people it helps people establish uh, conversations and set up support networks with other people which can be helpful in stressful situations Now, uh, trying to establish the link between welfare, animals, and domestic violence. As has been mentioned already this morning, many of these notions are present. Many victims of domestic violence resist 
leaving the abusive relationship for fear of uh, their pets being at harm. Often these animals, these pets, are the only emotional support system these people have and to be left without them is out of the question. On the other hand, children and uh, youngsters, victims of violence, when they have uh, pets, they tend to have better uh, social uh, and, health, uh, and mental health indicators than those children who do not have pets to rely on. Finally, many victims of uh, violence... Oh, I do apologize, I have finished, says the speaker. I will now pass the floor over to Sophia, who will be talking about more specific situations in terms of domestic violence. Thank you. Good morning to all. I would like to, before I start, reinforce the importance of uh, this conference today and once more thank uh, the Ombudsperson, the opportunity to be here discussing something which we need to find urgent answers for. We need to uh, develop qualitative research so that we can uh, be in direct contact with uh, victims of domestic violence, especially women victims of domestic violence, to be able to characterize their needs when they have pets and when they decide to break away from the abusive relationship or how the presence of pets is often <laughs> a uh, cause for worsening of the violence itself. So what brings us here today is the objective to share with you the voices of these women, obviously making it clear that some dimensions seem to stand out when we analyze uh, these accounts. And one of the first things that tend to pop up in the backgrounds of these women who we've talked to and both in our professional practice and, and uh, at an academic level is this strong bond between women, victims of domestic violence and their pets. And I'd like to leave you some excerpts from uh, these interviews, I can't live without them, I don't exist without my dogs, they're my children, I have a very close relationship to them, I've never been able to not have pets, I treat them as though they are virtually my children, and I was very happy with them, pets, whilst I grew up I wanted my daughter to also experience that, and we will uh, see uh, further along uh, that uh, the aggressors often don't allow the victims to ha have pets. So pets are a strong emotional support for women victims of domestic violence and in some contexts they are often the only uh, social support mechanism and I'll share some more quotes. The only thing I had that was my own was my pets, my job, nothing more. My pets were often my emotional support both at the time and when I left so I would not feel completely alone. If I didn't have them, I don't know how this story would have ended. I have to thank my cats for being here. Another uh, woman said, my pets show me every day I'm able to love. Without why, I didn't know and I wouldn't have known this unconditionality that pets give you, this safe love. There's a being that will not hurt you, that will not call you stupid, that will not let you think that you're unable to do whatever you want with your life. More accounts relating to this unconditional source of love. My pets have the role to help us stand up and keep going. They help us to relieve. They have the capacity to snuggle and care. And another one which I'd like to highlight, and often these victims uh, are suicidal with very complex uh, depressions and this uh, victim what she said was that she was already planning to take her life I was already saying goodbye to everyone when my mum brought C he needed me and I needed him what I was planning with him vanished 
disappeared. I wouldn't be here if I didn't have them. They are a natural sedative. He, the aggressor, didn't like them. He knows that one of the reasons why I don't tolerate his stuff is this reinforcement, this army with me that helps me. I think this is a very powerful metaphor. This sense of security and safety that emanates from this relationship is um, incredible. She felt safe in the presence of her animals. Animals are, as has been said repeatedly, used as weapons against victims in the sense that they are often threatened, coerced. And I'd like to refer that we encounter three strategies where this happens. On the one hand, indirect violence through the form of threat and coercion, but with a clear objective of affecting the victims, then direct violence, where violence is perpetrated against animals also, and a third dimension, which has to do with uh, depriving someone of the company of a pet. We have situations where victims already had pets, and when they enter into a, a relationship and go and live with the aggressive, are forbidden to take the pets along, or after a while, the pets simply disappear without the victims actually knowing what happened to them. And I will share with you some of these accounts. In case of threat and coercion, if you leave, I will kill your cats. That threat made me stay for a while and tolerate things I shouldn't, until it ended as it ended with me in the hospital after being severely beaten. I had tolerated many things because of them, fearing she could do something to them. I had feared for their lives on the day I left. I had another one, another victim who says, he, the aggressor, never had m mistreated my dogs, but for him they were a burden. He didn't mistreat them, but didn't treat them either. There was a time when they were at my parents and I feared he could go over and hurt them to hurt me. I couldn't have pets when I was with him. I had two dogs. One of them I took from my parents and the other one was adopted. I had to give them both away. Another account says, after he left, the aggressor, he started to threat the pets I have now. So this particular victim was never allowed to have pets and when she did get pets, she started to be threatened by. Recently we had to go to the court and he used pets as a way to blackmail me. And now some examples of direct violence. He threw the cat out of the window. I don't know if he died or not. I believe that uh, with the first dog, he, the aggressor, unloaded his fury uh, on uh, him when I wasn't home. He died strangled in a tree and I always thought it was the person. He was the person who killed him. I believe he did it. This is the case of a victim who lost her pets, especially this dog who uh, she had before the relationship and later on the animal uh, appeared dead and she believes it was the ex-husband who killed the dog. Another account, T, the bird, went through a lot with him, her, in this case her father. He was always trying to hurt him. Obviously we can't bring all the accounts here, but just to give you an idea, this father used to break the wings of this bird, something he used to do with the clear intent of threatening this young girl at the time for her not to report him. Once the aggressor tried to throw the birdcage through and out of the fifth floor window, Sometimes he was left free at home and he punched him with violence. One of the things which uh, I believe uh, interests us the most to, in order to discuss here, and it's extremely important when we're talking about uh, violence towards pets and people, has to do with how we can actually meet the needs of victims. And what we have proven over time is that the non-possibility, in this case of women, of taking with them 
when they leave, their pets restricts them in their decisions. And many do not leave for that very same reason and, for, and because they consider the pets to be members of the family. And what many victims say is that if I don't leave my daughter or son behind, then I'm not going to leave my dog, cat, rabbit, whatever the animal is. And so I bring you some accounts of uh, this very same thing. When they told me I had to leave, my first concern was, and my dogs. I left only with the clothes I was wearing. My priority was taking them from there. I put them in the car and simply left. We don't have the to full account of her uh, that she made, but in this case, this uh, uh, la lady was uh, escorted by um, the police and told to remove everything she could apart from the animals and she left everything behind and only brought the dogs. I told the police I could not leave without my pets. I got them out of there and took them to work. She knew she hurted me more when she harmed them instead of harming me. They were the first to leave that house. If I had a place for them, I would have, uh, wouldn't have left. How could I have left with that and leave them behind? Uh, it's a question which uh, would be simple if we put ourselves in the shoes of someone who has to leave behind one of the most important things one has. Um, where she was uh, sheltered to, to uh, authorize the presence of, of animals. Uh, um, Animals are not uh, assets, are uh, living beings. Now, the impacts of this uh, potential or real um, separation between pets and, uh, pets and, and women victims of domestic violence. Uh, the place where I was uh, didn't have conditions for them. They slept in the car and uh, uh, caves for two days, but then I had to take them to my parents' home. I miss them so much. I think that, that was the most difficult for me, although it's hard to believe. Uh, their absence was the hardest. Uh, he, uh, the aggressor, didn't want pets. I always had uh, tried. Uh, it was so hard for me when I left um, relationship, the um, first things I had done was to have pets, uh, they were responsible, um, but she was very afraid that something might happen to her. And when we uh, ask victims on the measures that uh, should be implemented uh, at level of public policies, national legislation, many of them uh, told us that uh, it is important to create uh, mechanisms to protect animals and that animals uh, should be authorized to um, should be accepted in shelters in uh, in every county or district there should be a place to temporary host pets until the victims are in a safe situation people who are victims of violence are at the end of the line because they have uh, to take back so many things uh, to have a life at uh, minimum satisfactory and pets are essentials. Um, our uh, justice uh, gets uh, 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 about uh, society must stop seeing victims as uh, victims. We are persons, not numbers. Pets should be uh, should have the same rights. They are always the weakest link. Each aggressor knows the weakest point of the victims. Uh, uh, pets must be uh, followed so the victims don't lose the security element. Specific structures uh, uh, for pets must exist. Um, a kind of foster families, people who have uh, space to host pets. Uh, they are family, and if the family goes to shelter homes, they must go too. They give us everything. They should be protected. Penalties um, should be heavier uh, for those who uh, mistreat pets. To conclude, I would like to uh, speak uh, about 
uh, some aspects that are of concern and that result from these interviews. Now, first of all, these um, uh, victims uh, grew with 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 pets. Um, this is one of the reasons why this violence against pets disturbs uh, victims in such a significant manner. And then we have situations of uh, serious exposure to violence, both uh, physical, psychological, and also um, uh, sexual and, and social. Um, I would say that in 90% of the cases, uh, the perpetrators of violence used uh, firearms or, or, or threatened their vic victims with, with firearms. They had uh, firearms in their possession and they would threaten victims and animals with those weapons. And then the issue of mental health, which is very much present with uh, victims, experience psychopathologies, not only adult victims, but also children, several cases of uh, suicidal uh, tendencies. And uh, once again, the importance of uh, pets in the uh, routines of uh, victims, uh, both when they are exposed to violence and uh, when they are actually um, able to um, break away with their relationships. Now, what about the challenges uh, uh, for uh, regarding the protection of victims of domestic violence and their pets? And I believe that in Portugal we are still um, light years away from what we've heard here today uh, with regards to other countries. We still have a system of risk assessment that does not include in an adequate manner um, pets. Obviously, I, I know it is true that the government made significant steps during the last uh, one or two years uh, with regards to collecting information on pets in the life of uh, victims of domestic violence, but the instruments that are used to assess risk are not uh, yet fine-tuned with the need to explore in a detailed manner, you know, the type of animals and the possibility of taking them uh, out of a um, violence uh, situation as well. And then um, shelters, uh, which is a uh, motive for, for concern. Uh, we know that uh, um, there has been a trend to try to, 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 to actually um, welcome um, pets to, to shelters, but uh, uh, if you work in those shelters, I mean, you know that these situations are very rare. Um, situations in which uh, animals have been welcomed to those shelters. Um, there is no victim of violence who is um, happy with the fact that uh, uh, her pet will uh, have to go to uh, a kennel or a s some other kind of, of uh, place that she is not familiar with. And then um, we uh, do not, uh, as far as what victims can s tell us, is that uh, um, the uh, profession animals should be protected and uh, they should not be at the mercy of uh, um, perpetrators of aggression. Thank you uh, very much for your attention and I hope that uh, from this uh, conference uh, that the outcome of this conference is the creation of work groups because there is a lot of work to be done and uh, Thank you very much, uh, Sophia and uh, Alice. Uh, thank you very much for the information you've uh, uh, provided us. I would like to ask whether um, anyone has a question for uh, these two speakers. Well, uh, 
those are two very interesting uh, presentations with regards to the first uh, um, presentation. Uh, Pat, um, you know, one of their uh, important roles as social mediators has been mentioned. Um, they are um, They also play a part in a theory, as therapeutical uh, agents, namely in, in certain uh, psychiatric uh, psychologies. In your experience and uh, at the university, I confess that in the meantime I um, visited the website of Maya University, do you have any kind of information with regards to the uh, uh, efficiency of, of this? Uh, there are very few publications with regards to the beneficial uh, effect that is uh, uh, known only via statements, but nobody has actually quantified the um, theoretical uh, benefits of uh, pets. Do you have any kind of information vis-à-vis -vis this? Well, with regards to the at the University of Maya, I did not refer the advantages of uh, animal-assisted uh, therapies because I was uh, I felt that I would be drifting away from the focus of this conference. But we do collaborate with an institution called the uh, Vincoli uh, that uh, does uh, uh, animal-assisted uh, therapy. We know we do not uh, really have studies that have been conducted by our university in this population, but we know that Vincolo, this association I mentioned, works with uh, people uh, that are incarcerated, and I know that they work with, with women that are in our uh, in Portuguese uh, prisons. And uh, according to what has been presented in the workshops, there is a very positive impact at the level of empathy, at the level of respect uh, uh, for the um, rules of the institution. The animal is used as a prize. I mean, if you um, abide by the rules and, and if you're not aggressive next week, you will have the opportunity of, of uh, uh, actually um, going to a, an animal-assisted therapy. So at the university, we do not yet have this kind of study, but we do have some uh, connection with um, associations that uh, do it, and the impact is very positive. Any further question? I would like just to say that uh, in the uh, now speaking about legal uh, the legal area, you know some of these cases are even taken to court. Uh, some of the cases are shocking, but it is very important to actually say that uh, we've had a case of a father that uh, fed the guinea pigs of his uh, uh, son. You know has a um as a you know a way to 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 have some influence on on his uh, um child uh the aggressor actually cooked the animals and uh, fed them to uh his son he was not condemned uh, because uh, this was before the law that punished uh, um abuse of animals, but he was condemned for abuse of his uh, son. And then we have another case uh, in Portugal, uh, that was the case of the aggressor that uh, went uh, back to the uh, home of the victim to uh, kill uh, her dog and to actually um, uh, slaughter as uh, and prepare it as if it was and uh, food for the victim uh, herself. So this is very much uh, a part of the crime of uh, um, family violence and uh, mistreatment or abuse of animals. Anything else from the audience? Well, uh, the Portuguese uh, 
uh, Association for Animals animal rights we have several cases such as the one these ones that have been mentioned and we are uh, you know we we have several uh, social workers that uh, contact us uh, by order of the court you know people have to leave their homes um, there is no provision with regard to where the animals should go and we have cases of people that uh, are given just one room temporarily and the animal is either abandoned uh, in the streets we have several cases uh, we have several animals uh, of animals that are with us and uh, the owners actually uh, walk them on Sundays until they get uh, until they can find a better place to stay um, sometimes the animal um, even dies uh, of, of, of uh, uh, grief and uh, I think we need commitment to solve this you know social um, workers should uh, have the training for these kind of things and, and uh, so should courts because uh, um, politicians uh, social workers or the courts are not really ready to work uh, and decide on these cases and animals are just um, uh, something that uh, is not uh, important they not, do not respect animals they uh, and they do not respect the human beings uh, hum human beings and they end up causing even more problems or bigger problems thank you very much uh, we will consider this session closed we will be back after lunch and uh, um our agenda um we will be back at uh, 2 p.m. slightly later because we are now 15 minutes behind schedule. We'll try to start as soon as possible on time, uh, says the speaker, if possible. Thank you very much for your presence.
Mas espero não gritar muito. Boa tarde. Um, com um bocadinho de atraso já. Vamos. Good afternoon. We are slightly behind schedule, but uh, let us uh, kick off. And um, first of all, I would like to thank the invitation that was uh, addressed to me by Laurentina Pedros to be the moderator of this uh, round table. Um, I'm very pleased to be here together with uh, those present here in the panel and uh, also with regards to the subject of this, uh, the topic of this uh, session. So without further ado, uh, we will start this session. I know this is right after lunch, nevertheless I hope it is a relatively interesting subject to uh, really keep uh, you with us. We will not have much time for answers, for questions, for a Q&A, but we'll have just, just have to see at the end. Um, just a brief reference to our speakers, uh, because uh, you have in in your programs, you have a detailed uh, resume of each of the speakers. Now, following what has been proposed by the um, organization, I will give the floor to uh, Mark Paulin, who is uh, here next to me, and I'd like to say that he's a forensic psychologist, and uh, please be kind to consult the um, program for a more detailed CV. Now, Good afternoon to all. First of all, I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Dr. Uh, Paul Lara for the um, invitation to be here and uh, before I uh, start I just wanted to uh, thank the invitation so in terms of my presentation I'm talking about this topic there's a lot of scientific information on exactly the interactions between pets or animals and humans how this relationship promotes good uh, health but not everyone who has pets treat them properly and in terms of the available news on the media for instance this um, article uh, in the Espresso states that cats and dogs are also victims of domestic violence and we have had over the years many examples of uh, the, the link between domestic violence and cruelty towards animals. We have another case, for instance, from 2018, which uh, describes cruelty acts towards an animal. And we can see that over the course of the years, this is a topic which uh, comes up frequently and which warrants a more technical approach. We should set up research groups with a focus on certain topics to be able to further investigate and study the specific uh, profiles of people who are involved in cruelty towards animals. And it's not just restricted to dogs and cats. And uh, this is, these are just uh, pieces of uh, news uh, that has come out over the years. And uh, this kind of behavior is also seen, for instance, among juvenile delinquents. And there's a case, uh, a very recent one, uh, dating back to 2020, where a group of students from a school um, abused and mistreated a, a female cat, and even the school uh, itself and its setup caused a hindrance and constraint for it to be uh, treated and rescued by the health authorities and the uh, animal association so this has to do with uh, society it uh, 
is something which we see everywhere throughout the country, whether it's coastal areas inland, north, south. So here we also see some more news on the barbaric attack on another animal. And so we need to look at the profile of the aggressors. What are the behavioral hints and indications that are normally behind. And then we also try to and have to continue systematizing the information which comes from all sorts of areas and establish this link, the link and the theory of the link, which determines that people who uh, abuse animals also have a tendency to be violent towards, namely, people also. And we should identify these profiles as soon as possible Abuse towards animals should be seen as a red flag and look and we have to look at this as a clear indication of future acts of violence. So domestic violence, child abuse and cruelty towards animals are all intimately linked with one another and we have to start fighting this condition which directly impacts human and animal well-being and this cruelty towards animals is inevitably connected to other statistics. This is a s retrospective analysis of um, cruelty towards animals in uh, younger age groups. So we have from 25% of aggressive male prisoners, 30 of convicted child molesters, 36 of assaulters of women, 46 of incarcerated sexual homicide perpetrators, and so on. So these uh, percentages re relate to a link between violence towards people and its link with violence towards animals and the violence towards animals is just the tip of the iceberg a clear indication of a higher likelihood of aggressors also perpetrating domestic violence we have also the likelihood of animal fights uh, being another pattern that has to be looked into and we must look at all of this in a systematic, consistent way. And international research has showed us this. This is a reference article uh, published some years ago, 27. In Portugal, we seem to be lagging uh, behind because this is something which is already uh, touched upon and uh, studied more in depth elsewhere. So we're talking about uh, cruelty to animals, violence to people. So cases, case histories of serial killers and mass murderers suggest that many were cruel to animals in their childhood. That, so animal cruelty should be a red flag which helps us understand the need to intervene because not intervening will allow the aggressor to continue to perpetrate aggressions towards um his or her household, but also to others. And mistreatment towards animals are often, and these behaviors are often copied and applied uh, to people. A, an animal mistreated in a household is not just a mere uh, object which may indicate a crime. It's a sign that others may be at risk. And so we must prevent the risks and end the cycle of violence. This is an international study which demonstrates that all entities working in childhood matters in this country place in their diagnostic assessments a question on the existence of abuse in uh, the household and at home. And if uh, this is detected then a child in these conditions and circumstances is considered to be at risk. And as I mentioned, domestic violence is something which does not only affect Portugal, it goes beyond our borders. And statistics show us that 
less than 3% of shelters have any kind of uh, shelter for animals and 25 to 40% of victims of domestic violence actually admit that they don't leave their abusive environments because they don't want to leave their pets behind. Therefore, we have to consider adequate response for this uh, population and for all these victims. 71% of victims reported that the aggressor, as a means of causing suffering, threatened to or actually threatened or killed pets. And that's uh, why we have a picture of a child cuddling a dog. And I have actually come across in my own experience uh, many children who, when listening to their parents fight and their fathers beat their mothers, sought refuge with the pets to try and soothe their uh, distress. So we have to be able to deal with this huge problem, taking all of this in uh, to account and although there are pilot projects there are no shelters currently taking in victims and pets and we have to look at the geographies of these shelters see what are the social uh, responses maybe uh, temporary uh, foster care uh, where people can go and visit their pets uh, so that when pe victims are back on their feet they can recover and retrieve their pet uh, with which they would have never lost the connection because these structures would enable uh, the relationship to continue. And if we look at a historical timeline, we see that um, murderers and in a group of a hundred patients there were three common behaviors to most childhood and adolescent uh, experiences enuresis which is bedwetting um, frequent uh, acts of uh, starting fires and animal cruelty and the same happened with 84 adult prisoners convicted for violent crimes. If we continue along this uh, um, background, 80,000 recorded situations of which 268 resulted in a criminal proceeding and look at the difference in figures. 70% of, of these uh, criminals also had a criminal record for violence, theft, use of drug, uh, drugs and vandalism. This is scientific evidence and to be concerned with this allows us to prevent victims within other contexts, whether we are fond of animals or not. And what can we also identify from this is that those who perpetrate these crimes against animals have a generalized emotional deficit and emotional detachment. And if a person does this to an animal, then this kind of emotional deficit and detachment will be expressed towards spouses, children and other uh, people in close proximity. So we see also other evidences such as larger levels of aggressiveness. It, it is it has been documented that these aggressors often have problems regarding self-esteem and the way to compensate and make up for this, this is to show aggression and therefore this is a sort of compensation mechanism. In terms of general behavioral pattern when it comes to the rights of others and uh, social norm we see that uh, there, are, there is a low 
a threshold when it comes to frustration. There are also cognitive distortions concerning uh, animal conduct and animal cru cruelty. Often they see cruelty as a way of correcting bad behavior, that they want to impress others, they want to use their animals to get back at someone else. And we see this often as a, a means to uh, exert pressure in a context of domestic violence. And there are those who actually just simply say that it's all for fun. And we must not forget that this kind of violence does not, is not restricted to this. Aggressors in domestic violence tend to exploit the emotional link victims have with their pets as a way of emotionally blackmailing them, coerce them, and increase uh, the uh, cycle of violence. And normally a victim takes about 13 years to actually put a stop on uh, this kind of violence. When we look at animal cruelty, we also see that uh, the aggressors come from chaotic households, themselves had aggressive parents. Cruelty uh, towards animals shows uh, exactly a propensity for uh, other violent behavior in adult life. For instance, when I go to schools and have teachers who say, for instance, oh, this student likes to cut off uh, lizards' tails, for instance, this in itself should be seen as a red flag. Also, youth who have um, admitted to mistreating animals are more likely to uh, become hostile and aggressive towards people. Of uh, the many uh, assessments uh, I have made, I'd say uh, that uh, I have never been asked to assess an aggressor in terms of their history of uh, cruelty towards animals. Other things are looked at, such as cruelty towards children or sexual abu abuse uh, and other uh, criminal acts, but never the actual fact of having exerted some sort of uh, aggressive uh, behavior towards an animal. Of uh, 150 aggressors of an average 37 years of age, Caucasian 68% uh, employed a single at the time of the aggression and with children, the different percentages. Uh, most were arrested for uh, aggressing their animal, 40, uh, for, uh, uh, 46%, 96% had a criminal record for other crimes, and uh, we have a significant sample of people, it may not seem that much, but 1.8% responded yes to whether if you, in your entire life, did you ever hurt or be cruel to an animal or pet on purpose, and of these 775 who admitted to that, showed vis-a-vis uh, -vis the others more uh, animal cruelty levels associated with all sorts of uh, mental disorders and addictions and therefore they were 17 times more likely to have mugged someone, to have started fires or to have threatened someone. So as you can see this is a an encompassing concern when it comes to criminal behavior. Therefore, the te technical, uh, ethical, moral duty to look into this. And more recently, and it's been uh, obviously a trend recently, but we had a, a week of mass shootings um, because of yet another case happening in the US and this retrospective analysis which looked at 20 mass shooters 75 percent had in their background cruelty towards animals and those tended to be younger at the time of the offense compared to those who didn't have a history so those who mistreat animals are more likely to start to commit other crimes sooner and so regarding cruelty towards animals, 
the examinee revealed to have been scratched by cats during his childhood and as a reaction he shoved uh, the cat away often it was my neighbor's cat who came over when uh, uh, she, she invited me and the cat used to scratch me and I shoved him away and then a uh, question as to whether he mistreated animals he said well I didn't mistreat as such but at the center joking around with other boys we did tie up uh, the paws of a dog and left him in his uh, um, dog house and forgot him then only the following day did we remember we had left him there and another uh, 17 year old for instance who acknowledged uh, to having committed violent acts against animals stating that uh, he had rabbits at his father's farm he used to um, poke them with sticks in their bellies and sometimes kill them by strangling them. So uh, we have to identify these clear signs of risks. And I wanted to also benefit from this opportunity to bring here very briefly um, to this talk the um, need to look at the victims, not just the aggressors. The fact that um, testifying in court for a victim is often associated with potential negative effects, the so-called secondary, secondary victim, victimization. The system ends up victimizing uh, the victim again, which brings about a cognitive and emotional overload. And if we look at, for instance, what goes on, namely right next door in Spain, there are contexts where the fact that there are animals and support animals um, in court, like dogs, for instance, assisting victims, this helps in uh, relieving some of this uh, so-called overload, which is caused by testifying uh, on violence and abuse and so there are clear evidences of these facilitators uh, and their uh, work in court and the more credible the testimony of a witness the better the court has in terms of and the more the court has in terms of uh, reliable evidence and in Spain for instance and in Madrid um, there is a, a, a common practice of whenever children have to testify in court, they uh, are accompanied by a dog, which makes their lives much easier. So I'd just like to leave this remark that pioneering countries such as the US, Australia and Finland have been working on the topic. There is more than 10 years of research and I'm always quite perplexed when there is scientific evidence that we don't actually think about things more seriously. I mean, obviously things don't have to be done all of a sudden without actually reflecting on the uh, different uh, circumstances uh, of each country and circumstance, but there is a profile of work that has to be done. And in actual fact, the um, people who work within these contexts, namely uh, in this process of uh, animals accompanying children uh, to court hearings, uh, describe how this uh, has a, such a massive um, and positive effect because the children can walk the dogs to the to the courtroom they feel a lot more relaxed they are able to provide far more spontaneous and reliable testimonies so final considerations research on the topic of uh, aggression and cruelty toward animals amongst other forms of violence has really led to an unveiling of characteristics of aggressors 
and the cruelty towards animals should help identify potential aggressors and determine the actual uh, level of danger they pose. It's not just by chance that our police forces have a form called uh, domestic violence risk form and the second item foresees uh, the um, indic information as to whether there is a pet or not within the household. A mistreated a pet within family environment is an indicator of potential other victims at risk. We should all work towards uh, implementing the necessary mechanisms for these kind of crimes not to be um, overlooked without the consequences that they deserve. And we have to, uh, even if we want, go back in time and recover uh, Schopenhauer's words that the compassion towards animals is intimately linked with a kindness of character and who those who are cruel to animals cannot be good to mankind. Thank you. Obrigado, Mauro. Please spell me. Thank you very much, Mauro, um, especially for uh, sticking to the time that had been allocated to you. Um, I believe that we are slightly um, ahead of schedule, so I will allow um, some minutes for questions or I'll, better, I'll allow just one question right now. Any question? No questions? So in that case let's uh, use these minutes at the end of the session if needed. Our guest, um, uh, Dr. Phil Harko, to that you, all of you or some of you uh, here this morning to, to address his, his, his conference. Thank you, Dr. Phil. There we go. Hello there again. <laughs> Everybody have a nice lunch? Move your arms, wake up, okay? <laughs> Stand up, turn around, just <laughs> don't be afraid. Uh, Portuguese love to eat heavy meals, don't they? <laughs> Oh, it's good to be back. Before I get started, I want to address something that came up this morning during Liz Ormerod's uh, presentation. And somebody asked a very uh, good question about if veterinarians are required to report suspected animal abuse, would that mean that people would be less likely to take their animals to the veterinarian? It's an excellent question, and I hear that question all the time. And she touched on a couple of answers, but just let me go into a little bit more detail on that. Um, first of all, uh, physicians crossed that exact, asked that exact same question back in the 1960s when physicians were required to report child abuse. And there has been no evidence that people have stopped going to doctors as a result of possibly having to report child abuse. So we don't think it's, it's a real issue to worry about. Secondly, it may not be the abuser who brings the animal in. It could be somebody else in the family or a well-meaning family member or a neighbor or something who brings uh, the animal in. Uh, it could also be if it's a large animal practitioner out on the farm or a mobile veterinarian, they see the abuse going on in the household. So there's that scenario as well. Failing to report suspected abuse not only uh, enables the abuser to continue doing the bad actions, but it also puts other animals in the household at risk. So it may not just be the patient, it may be other animals there that are in danger. Um, and Liz mentioned that by presenting yourself as a reporter of suspected abuse, the public recognizes that and the public respects that and you're more likely to get more business and more clients from a community that cares deeply about animals. Uh, and it engenders trust uh, between the practitioner and the client. Uh, another factor is the biggest uh, dilemma that veterinary medicine faces, which is where is the primary responsibility? Is it to the patient or is it to the client? The client pays the bills, 
but the patient should be the primary uh, care and consideration. And finally, are these the kind of clients you want in your practice? Do you want to be dealing with animal abusers? I don't think so. So just a few thoughts. Um, and I'm sorry Liz couldn't be here. I've known Liz for 35 years, and she's absolutely amazing with what she's done. What I want to do now is talk about some practical ideas for practitioners to put some of these ideas into action. And I will be referring largely to one brand new document that just came out, and I'll show it to you and hope you jot down the website, because you know, rather than me reading everything, you can download it, and it's, a, it's an amazing document yourself. Uh, what I hope, how many of you are veterinarians here? Okay, good, we have quite a number. Those of you who are not, take this information to your veterinarian, okay? <laughs> Let them know there are others out there who care about this. But we want veterinarians to understand what this is all about, what their role is, and why a pr uh, proactive response is important. And to educate themselves and their staffs on how to recognize, record, and report possible animal cruelty. And I emphasize the word possible because, let me see, I think that, I don't know that the pointer is working here. Did somebody turn that off? Um, is that button there? Okay, well, the word possible. Um, because um, you don't have to know that it's cruelty. You just have to suspect something. It's like the signs at the airport. If you see something, say something. And that's what it really is all about. Um, and to plan ahead and have a protocol in place so that one of these cases comes up, you know what to do with it. They don't happen often, but when they do, it's going to be very confusing, and it's best to have a, pra a protocol in place to report suspected animal maltreatment. Veterinarians often say, why should I get involved with all this? I might lose a client, I might lose money, it's not my job. Well, the fact is, veterinarians are responsible for public health, and, and abuse, whether it's against humans or animals, is a public health problem. It puts others at risk, the two-legged and four-legged members of the family, and the bottom line is it does what veterinarians have been trained to do. It improves the well-being of animals. We mentioned the One Welfare umbrella before. Uh, my feeling on this is that veterinarians are the first line of defense for animals that are mistreated. And by reporting suspected abuse, it takes a One Health or a One Welfare approach as that first line of defense. Veterinarians will see cases of abuse and neglect. It's mostly neglect. I think we saw some statistics this morning. Overwhelmingly, it's inadvertent neglect from people who just would like to take care of their animals, but other circumstances get in the way or they just don't know how to care for animals properly. And one of the big challenges I've discovered is that in veterinary medicine, veterinarians are trained to see a situation, to diagnose it accurately, to treat it, and move on, okay? Well, animal cruelty doesn't work like that because it's vague and you don't have a complete history and you don't know exactly what it is and the veterinarians can't specifically identify it. They're afraid to touch it. They don't want to get involved with it. So these are difficult situations. And very little of this is included in veterinary school training. That's another gap in the system. Handling these cases takes much more time than most practitioners are, are willing to give. It takes a lot of experience. They're emotionally draining. You have to be sensitive not only to the animal's needs, but to the human uh, members around. It takes tact, and frankly, not a small degree of courage as well. I'm gonna show you some of the common presentations. Jot down this website if you're interested in this. It's the, in the United States, it's the state of Ohio, the Ohio Veterinary Medical Association, ohiovma.org. They came out with this manual last year. There have been a number of these manuals out there. This is the newest one, and it's probably the most specific and most comprehensive for the veterinarian on how to recognize and report suspected animal abuse and neglect and cruelty. And I won't go into this in great detail because of time, and it's awfully hard to read, but all this comes from there. What they do in great detail in this manual is look at an extensive list of common presentations that the veterinarian might see 
and findings that are suggestive of what we now call NAI, non-accidental injury. And that's a crossover. That's a term from the child protection field. They use that term to describe physical child abuse. So what kind of findings might you see, how to document it, and what kind of testing and evidence preservation is necessary for each of these types of cases. And just in alphabetical order, abrasions, bruising, asphyxiation, burns, dog fighting, drowning, drugs, a collar that's embedded in the animal's neck, eye injuries, foot injuries, gunshot wounds, head traumas, internal injuries, knife wounds, and, and repetitive injuries, okay? And again, for each of these, it's you know, findings that suggest non-accidental injury, how to document it, what kind of testing, photos, and evidence preservation will be necessary. It's a marvelous way to look at this and some specifics on how to deal with these cases. They have another section in the manual. Oftentimes, the client will say, oh, I didn't beat the dog, he was hit by a car. Well, there are differences between, between the injuries that are caused by somebody kicking the dog or throwing it, the cat against the wall and getting hit by a car. And so it goes into the different types of injuries, what you might find in, in the, the observation, you know, and then this kind of sign looks like an accident. This one is more likely to be a non-accidental injury. And again, I won't go through all that in great detail. Again, you can download that. We have it on our National Link Coalition website, and the Ohio Veterinary Medical Association has it on their website as well. Um, some red flags for uh, abuse of small animals, and a lot of this came from Helen Monroe's work in, in the UK. Liz uh, mentioned some of that. But some of the general uh, considerations, if, you know, in terms of the uh, patient history and the interaction with the client. If the medical history is vague or the story changes and different people in the household are giving you different stories, if the history that is given to you doesn't match what your clinical findings show, um, they have displaced priorities. They're not a lot, there's not a lot of concern. They're not really attached to the animal, or there's a delay in bringing the animal in for treatment, or they say the animal is accident prone. They refuse pain medication, or they refuse basic care, or there's some kind of a unexplained delay in seeking treatment, where you see a frequent turnover of pets and they've just never developed a strong emotional attachment to them. Or you may know that there is other violence going on in the household, particularly in a smaller community. You may know everybody uh, in the neighborhood and may know that there are other issues going on, or substance abuse, or economic problems, marital uh, discord. The owner might even admit injuring the animal. We often find people will brag about hurting animals because they think it makes them sound more macho, makes them sound more powerful. They don't realize they're, commi they're admitting to a crime. And then, of course, the animal hoarder who brings in excessive numbers of animals, okay? Then from the, you know, when you see that animal, you evaluate it, you look at the diagnostics, you know, everything from chronic and untreated uh, medical problems, new injuries on top of old injuries, multiple wounds, multiple scars, fractures in various stages of healing, uh, poor body condition scoring, um, specific types of, of localized injuries, the animal's afraid of the owner. These are some telltale signs. We also have some distinctive signs for dog fighting and for cock fighting. Um, they'll pay for the services in cash. It's usually the pit bulls and the bully breeds we talked about earlier. Typical scarring around the muzzle, on the, on the front legs. Uh, the t ears may be cropped to give the other animals less to grab onto in a fight. They may be vaccinating their own dogs. Uh, they may be getting their own antibiotics and uh, wound treatment. They won't give you specific details. Uh, they own several pit bull terriers. And, you know, in looking at the animals, it's usually a young pit bull terrier or a related breed. The teeth may be broken or missing. They are, they're thin with a low body condition score but they're very well muscled. These are extremely powerful dogs. They're often wearing this heavy logging chain or heavy collar, uh, significant wounds, like I said, to the face or front, uh, bite marks on, on the limbs, uh, wounds and fractures in various stages of healing. Uh, their paws are abraded and so forth. 
similar issues with cockfighting. And I won't go into these in great detail, but it's a similar situation. Some, fish, uh, some features that should raise the index of suspicion. And I need to make the point repeatedly that the veterinarian does not need to know. The lawyers will figure that out. The courts will make a determination. The, uh, the veterinarian just needs to have concrete examination information and present a cohesive, coherent report of what happened and then let the legal system decide what to do with it. So the veterinarian does not need to know. They just need to have a reasonable suspicion. Some of the things that should raise the veterinarian's index of suspicion, and no one of these alone is a red flag, but in combination, they really start to raise uh, your, your concern. It may be, and Liz mentioned a few of these as well, it may be a client that is new to your practice, or there are cases of vet, what we call vet shopping. They will go to different veterinarians in a community to avoid arousing suspicion by continually going back to the same practitioner. There may be this turbulent history of, of animals coming and going, or just constant behavior problems, or you may know of uh, these family pressures, uh, or economic pressures. Uh, they may let you know that there's family violence going on. You may suspect animal hoarding, and one really serious red flag is if a client comes in and asks that all of her animals be put to sleep, call the suicide prevention hotline. That is a surefire sign that she's trying to clean up her life and get rid of all of her obligations before she commits suicide. The client's behavior could be a warning sign. If they don't give a full history, or it's an inconsistent history, the story that they're giving you doesn't match the injuries you're seeing, or there are discrepancies, the story keeps changing, or different people in the family tell you different stories. Or she may say she doesn't feel safe at home. You may be concerned that the, that the client is isolated and doesn't have any social support, or she has too many animals. One partner may be nervous and deferential around the other. Uh, the person bringing the animal in may just be indifferent and not have a lot of uh, concern for the animal. <laughs> Excuse me, is that my phone? <laughs> just hang up or whatever, okay. <laughs> I turned my phone on, uh, you know, just so I could talk to my wife and now people are calling me from back home, <laughs> okay. Um, they may be aggressive or argumentative, uh, and again, that delay in seeking medical attention. The patient's medical history may be a warning sign. Repetitive injuries, unexplained injuries, deaths to other animals in the household, multiple fractures over various periods of time, young puppies and kittens and older animals are more at risk, the fighting breeds of dogs are more at risk, and Helen Monroe in the UK identified Munchausen syndrome by proxy as a serious issue here. Uh, for those of you not familiar with it, Munchausen syndrome by proxy is where somebody, usually a woman, takes her child, you know, injures her child, rushes the child to the pediatrician or the emergency room, and gets all sorts of praise for saving the child's life by rushing the child to the hospital, okay, because she needs that ego support. They do it to their dogs, too, and their cats. And Helen found something like 9% of veterinarians in the UK had seen that phenomenon with um, people hurting their animals and then bringing them into the vet. We recommend having a protocol in place, and we have samples of these protocols from about nine or 10 veterinary hospitals on our website in our resources section. Uh, feel free to use any of those and adapt them uh, to your uh, purposes. Safety first. If you feel threatened, call the police. Don't put yourself or your staff at any risk. Treat the animal. The veterinarian certainly knows how to do that. Collect and document the evidence, okay? And evidence collection is a specialized topic. You've seen it on TV shows, CSI, and all that. Uh, but don't compromise a timely treatment for the animals. Again, recognize that this is not an exact science. Cruelty is a legal determination, not a medical one. You need to be prepared to act, but others will make that determination. You won't know for a fact that it's abuse, and you don't have to. Your job is to report it to the appropriate agency, let them investigate it, to document your findings objectively, and be prepared to testify in court about what you found. And that documentation needs to be a little bit more concise and detailed than what you might normally do with a regular case. 
Some specific steps, again, these, this comes from the Ohio Manual. Identify who's bringing the animal in. Get their full contact information, everybody's relationships, who else might have had interactions with the animals. Do a thorough description of the animal, its sex, its age, its breed, its license, its microchip. Um, you don't necessarily have to be specific because that could hang you up in court. If you say the dog is a three-year-old Cocker Spaniel, when in fact it's a two-year-old Brittany Spaniel, a good defense attorney is going to say, that, you know, you don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> okay? So just say, it appeared to be a three-year-old Cocker Spaniel. Right? Um, I've been in this field for 40 years. I still can't tell a Cocker and a Brittany Spaniel apart from each other. Record the owner's account of what happened. You know, use their own words wherever you can. Note any discrepancies. Identify whoever you talk to. That's part of this record here. Describe any unusual behaviors you see uh, between either the owner or the animal or how the animal reacts to the owner. Photographs will be essential. And we recommend micro photos of the wound itself, meso photos showing a mid-level and then a macro showing the entire animal. And those photos and the forensic evidence can be uh, extremely important. And have t a measuring stick or ruler next to it so people can see, you know, this, this was, wound was five centimeters long or three centimeters deep or whatever. Thoroughly describe the examinations and the findings that you come up with. And don't necessarily just focus on the presenting complaint. There could be other uh, issues going on. Again, include a very detailed assessment and include the animal cruelty or the non-accidental injury in the differential diagnosis and what your impression is as to how these uh, injuries affect the animal's comfort and well-being. Record any evidence of conditions that appear to be chronic or repeated, okay? Often they will say, this is a one-time thing, the animal was, was fine, and you can tell, no, this has been going on for a long time. Or they'll say, well, the dog looked fine when I went to work this morning. I don't know how he lost 30 pounds overnight, okay? You'll hear that. <laughs> you will hear that, okay? Uh, save and preserve all the physical evidence and uh, we'll be talking about veterinary forensics later and we'll go into more detail on that, but some of the things that we need to do to save that. Again, think of all the crime scene movies you've, you've seen. Record your recommendations, including any that the uh, client de declines to follow through. Try to come up with a, a treatment plan in writing and get them to sign off on it. And detail any education that you provided uh, that they followed through on or did not follow through on. And then document all the follow-up, all the communications you had with them or the uh, office visits they made or failed to appear for, because um, that could be relevant in an ongoing case. This came from New Zealand. Uh, the Veterinary Council in New Zealand came up with this model a number of years ago. It's an excellent model of uh, what to do when you see a case. First of all, is the case severe? Is it really severe neglect or cruelty or abuse? If so, advise the person immediately of a treatment, a plan of action, and notify whoever is the appropriate agency. It could be an animal protection agency, it could be municipal animal services, it could be law enforcement. Again, it depends on where you are and who the enforcing agency is. If it's a case that you think your own intervention or a, an educational approach might solve the problem and you're not required to report, then you have to make a difficult decision as to whether to report or not. By the way, having mandated reporting simplifies all that. You just have to say, the law requires me to make this report. I could lose my license if I don't. It doesn't mean that you're guilty. It doesn't mean you're going to jail. It doesn't mean the animal's gonna be taken away from you. It just means we're gonna investigate it further and it simplifies the process dramatically, okay? But if you think an intervention or education can solve the problem, no, notify the appropriate authorities. If you think maybe it can, talk to the person, agree on a plan, document it, implement it, monitor it, come up with a written plan, timelines, and outcomes. If you're satisfied with the outcome, fantastic, monitor it, if you're not satisfied, make the report to the agency. So it's a really good flow chart. This came again from New Zealand way back in 2012. They've been working on this for many, many years.
I'll let you take pictures of that if you want. I think we also have that in the manual, I don't remember, okay? Okay, what should you do if the owner admits causing harm but still comes in to seek medical services? Well, that, you know, the fact that they came in to seek treatment is not a good excuse for, you know, uh, for, for them or, you know, not a valid reason to not prosecute. And in fact, physical animal abuse may indicate a larger problem going on. Uh, the client may be uneducated about proper animal care. In that kind of a situation, educating the client may do, may do the job. But again, document your discussion and recommendations and make a report if they don't follow up on those recommendations. This gets back to the question about bullfighting earlier. The client may say, my, my cult, and we see this with immigrant uh, populations. They may come from a different culture where their concept of treating animals is different than ours. You know, and they claim, in my culture, this is accepted. You say, in our culture, it isn't. Okay, and regardless of, of whoever's culture it is, the health and the safety of the animal is the priority. Some other considerations. Be open to a differential diagnosis of non-accidental injury. Be familiar with what reporting laws there are. Obviously in Portugal you don't have them yet. We hope that changes, okay? Know where to report, and Laurentino was trying to tell me who to report to. I'm, I don't know what your systems are here. Maybe we'll talk about that here a little bit. Define who in the practice is allowed to make a report. This is an issue where what happens if the staff or one of the veterinary technicians wants to report, but the practice owner doesn't. You should have a protocol in place as to who is authorized to make a report and how junior members should approach senior colleagues. Uh, create a profile and a history for the client and a record of all the interviews. Conduct all these detailed examinations. Body condition scoring is, is very significant there. Um, often it helps to keep the animal overnight. This gives you a chance to reflect on the situation, maybe get a second opinion from a, from a colleague, keep the animal away from a potential abuser, and give you a chance to try to make a better determination as to what the situation is and what you want to do with that. Collect, document, and preserve the evidence. Again, veterinary pathologists can, can help you with that, and I'm sure there are some in, in Lisbon who can give you more details on that. Don't risk destroying or contaminating the evidence. Uh, again, comprehensive reports will be essential if this does go to court uh, and include everybody's comments, what other people in the office may have heard, and it often helps to have somebody else witness and document what happened. So in case the, cl the client says, well, the, the, the veterinarian was trying to frame me and you have another witness to corroborate your story, it certainly helps. Write a comprehensive report with a lot of detail and precision. Uh, that the Ohio manual has a standardized reporting form that you could certainly modify for use uh, here in Portugal with what that report should include. What happens next? We're trying to get veterinarians to make their practices a safe zone. And we have free posters on our website that you can download and say, this is a hit-free zone. People don't hit each other here. People don't hit animals here. This is a safe place. Or you can do this. Let me get this. I saw this years ago at a domestic violence conference where a number of veterinarians were attending. It's just a little button that says it's okay to talk to me about family violence and abuse. Wouldn't it be great if veterinarians and their staffs wore buttons like that? Wouldn't it be great if veterinarians had literature from the women's shelters in their clinics so people knew that, hey, we're here to fight all forms of violence and this is a friendly place? and we have resources, and we can refer you to the women's shelter in the community. Where you'd like to see veterinarians offer low cost or pro bono care for domestic violence uh, survivors and their pets, whether that's caring for the animals in the women's shelter or providing foster uh, homes for those animals while the women are in the shelter and giving them you know, discounts on pet food and, and, and services, uh, displaying literature help them to include pets in safety planning. Many domestic violence agencies haven't thought about including pets in those safety plans. 
And one of the big things is get all the documentation in her name. So if it gets down to an ugly divorce dispute and who should get the animal in the divorce settlement, the more she can show that she's been taking care of the animal and she pays the pet food bills and the veterinary bills and, and all the expenses involved with the animal, the more likely the court's going to be to award the animals to her rather than to the guy. I mentioned these practice manuals this morning. A group in Minnesota called Animal Folk, Folks of Minnesota, there's their website, designed this several years ago. Uh, it was replicated in the state of Oklahoma and then the state of Massachusetts. They are marvelous manuals. They're about that thick. They're full color, great veterinary forensic documentation as to what types of injuries to look for and processes. And it has the laws of those particular states. They could be modified in Portugal, uh, translated, of course, uh, but also with whatever Portuguese law says. And I can put you in touch with the people in Minnesota, and they'd be more than willing to license it for for use over here as well. The bottom row there are some other manuals. Uh, the one on the left is one that Paula Boyden in the UK and I wrote for the American Veterinary Medical Association. Uh, the two in the middle are from New Zealand. The one on the right is from uh, the Animal Welfare Federation uh, and the British Veterinary Association in the UK. And they just came out with an updated version of that just very recently. Again, we have all of these on our website at nationallinkcoalition.org and you can download them. So I'm not sure where we are on time. Um, see if we have any questions or comments or tomatoes you want to throw at me. Or <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Thank you very much, Dr. Okay. Phil. What a wonderful talk, as always. Yeah. OK. Um, <laughs> tempo para uma questão. So we have time for a question. If there are no questions, or maybe there are very many questions. Let us um, proceed. And at the end, we may have a little bit more time for a short uh, debate. We now will be listening to Isabel Pires and Justina Oliveira, professors at the Trazos Montes uh, e Alto Douro University, uh, working in the field of pathology. You have the floor. Thank you. Boa tarde. Good afternoon. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, Ombudswoman for um, allowing us to be part of the history of our country in this area. I believe that this is the beginning of a big, uh, a great story. So thank you very much for letting us uh, be part of this. So we'll be speaking about uh, giving the victim a voice. I'm a forensic pathology, Justine, uh, the same. And uh, as far as our animals are concerned, uh, unless we can actually give them uh, this voice and establish you know, this link, they will not be success uh, stories because there's nothing more we can do. I tried to um, not to be too violent in my presentations and uh, I um, tried to soften things, but this is what it is. Uh, and. Uh, it is uh, good uh, to be aware that this exists because in uh, the uh, necropsy uh, room I can't do uh, nothing else than actually uh, giving a voice to the victim. And in order to do that we need to identify the crime because uh, uh, some of the victims are not even identified and it is difficult um, to actually uh, get to the author of uh, uh, the crime of or whatever was the cause of death and uh, for that purposes the medical uh, the forensic examination uh, needs to be correct we need to establish the cause and circumstances of that uh, also to assess whether the animal suffered or not whether there was a repeated aggression that uh, may in fact represent 
uh, violence uh, correspond to violence in the alleged crime. So we need to prove the alleged crime, who is uh, the victim, uh, whether we uh, can justify the causal link, um, somebody wanted to speak to me because uh, he uh, was uh, sure that the um, uh, animal had been poisoned, um, but I told him that uh, he, I can't tell you that the animal died of non natural cause because I have to report what I see. And uh, this is it. I mean, I need to try to say or to, to, to report the evidence to to report um, the the silence and uh, I need to determine or whether there is somebody that uh, was a perpetrator that was connected to that act. So the histories that I have to share with you, uh, we uh, established a trust relationship with municipal veterinarians and also with some colleagues that uh, uh, work for the public prosecution because in practical terms it is only via those dogs that we can actually make this link. But it is very important to be able to move forward and our medical examination can not um, fail. Uh, OPCs uh, send us uh, the bodies of the animals and then what happens to our report is this uh, link uh, we need to, to learn and we need to improve our practices and the best way to give voice to a victim is to identify the critical aspects, the aspects where we can go wrong and if we identify those we uh, will certainly in avoid any mistakes and one of the critical aspects is the history also the maintenance of, of uh, uh, whatever record we can maintain of course my um, I, I keep lots of photographies of this and the uh, chain of uh, proof uh, cannot uh, fail I mean the uh, process cannot uh, continue uh, without assigning a guilt to the potential criminal uh, without um, uh, proofs and uh, we need to get them right. It is also important to uh, keep in mind that this is the uh, that uh, common sense is the best um, attitude to have. In a necropsy, uh, the worst thing that can happen to us is that uh, um, evidence, uh, the evidence that we found is not uh, accepted in court. It also depends on us to um, to be experts. Uh, they want our expertise, uh, something that is based in our experience without no judgments whatsoever. And that has to do with uh, collecting, uh, reporting and then interpreting because this is what the necropsy can actually tell us, the cause of death, the mechanism of death, whether the um, death was natural or violent. Uh, uh, the most important thing for me is the hour of death and the uh, chronological account of lesions, but at least we need to say whether the lesions have been inflicted uh, before the death or after the death. This needs to be uh, mentioned in the report because it is meaningful for the court. The necropsy report has got to include these three things, the cause of death, the death mechanism and the manner of uh, death, the legal cause of death, whether the death was natural or non-natural, so that it may in fact serve as uh, an ancillary with regards to uh, the laws. This animal here has uh, here a small problem but it didn't die due to this so we need to actually uh, report this to, to, to those that are in charge of uh, implementing the law. 
So how can we do? We need to um, look for uh, those that, that help, that look for help, as Phil said. Um, the uh, body of the animal uh, speaks uh, and our desire to to transmit, to, to actually report everything. I mean, we actually need to um, listen to what the body of the animal uh, tells us and we need then to translate that uh, into words without making any judgments and if uh, required to use our uh, medical reserve. Um, and I think that is uh, in the necropsy that uh, we have this obligation. We need to uh, make these uh, hidden lesions to cry out to humanity and say exactly what happened to this animal. Now I'm moving into uh, real uh, aspects and uh, um, if, if you are impressed please uh, uh, let me know and I'll move, uh, I'll quickly move forward. Now usually this is what I have when a um, gun is used, you know, the number of shots that we identify, the um, entry point, the exit point. Uh, I, I defended myself, for instance, because the animal was attacking me, for instance. That could be something that you need to report. Uh, the cases of poisoning, the profile of uh, somebody that poisons an animal is different from um, of a person that actually hits a, an animal with with uh, with uh, a bat, um, hiding uh, a body, the uh, premeditation, and also the cases um, where we actually have the display of the animal uh, body. These are uh, uh, cases that we uh, saw. I. Uh, show some other animals, you know, besides uh, uh, cats and dogs. Uh, I think we need to, we cannot neglect uh, other animals. Uh, I did not bring uh, wild animals because the law for them is slightly different. This animal was abandoned. Uh, uh, it has a perianal uh, hernia. Uh, there was a rupture and he walked around uh, this way and, and then he died. Best uh, chances I will call this a negligent situation and uh, I uh, will leave this to uh, your consideration. Uh, animals that we see like these, I mean these are common or more common. It's easy to say the cause of death, enunciation and dehydration, a uh, legal uh, cause of death. I don't know whether this uh, animal was deprived of, of uh, um, food or not, uh, but I need to say that I do not identify any uh, other um, illnesses that may suggest natural uh, death. I'm not saying that the animal died of starvation, uh, but I'm actually providing, um, you know, the, um, the tools that uh, allowed for a complete assessment. I say, for instance, that uh, the animal reflects this, but I need to say that he uh, fed himself because he had uh, um, stones and, and, and paper in his uh, sto in its stomach. Uh, the um, owner saying that the animal was was being fed. I mean that is not true. So we established a uh, uh, a relationship with our colleagues and municipal colleagues, and I asked them, you know, um, did you did the animal have uh, uh, food and and water at its disposal? Continuing uh, in negligent cases, which are the lighter ones, well, the um, uh, the owner was not that careful with this animal's uh, teeth. This animal had a necrosis of the tip of the tail and had uh, uh, had uh, trauma uh, um, 
we can actually put in the report that that, that the animal was was uh, hold by the tail and uh, as I said, I did not bring only a uh, cat and uh, a dog and, and pets. Some people have uh, donkeys and this uh, animal uh, was tied uh, uh, had had uh, a band around one of his uh, uh, legs and uh, grew with it. Uh, this animal was observed by colleague Justina. This was a, a wire that uh, uh, was tied around the uh, neck of this animal and he grew with that. Um, this animal was uh, found uh, with with the, um, with the with this wire around his neck by uh, one of our colleagues. Now here um, we continue with cruel situations. Let's breathe in a little bit. Obviously it's very easy to say that this was a hunting accident. I am not the one that needs to determine this. The only thing I need to do is to say what, what, what happened. Uh, this was the animal before and uh, afterwards. In this case uh, besides the aggression with the firearm and uh, you know this uh, body the body of this animal um, actually cries out that uh, the shot uh, was um, while the animal was moving and it was a threat against the owner of this animal I'm going to speak about these critical aspects that, you know, based in these cases, nothing can go wrong. Conditioning uh, has got to be right. The animal has got to uh, be, uh, to get to me, sealed. Integrity seals are here. And in some cases, you know, um, I have, you know, this is the first thing that I need to do is to, to, to see whether the animal has an identification and whether everything is right then to find the uh, projectile, the um, is not difficult. This is the wound. I, in this case, uh, I was required to actually say the distance at uh, which the gun had been shot. A blade, obviously, is very important to be able to, to describe all these uh, kind of situations and we uh, also performed an histology in this case we need to do whatever we can do where we see this uh, uh, this is this is uh, um, remainings of of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, gunpowder uh, so the court asks me uh, in fact whether the animal died uh, due to uh, these lesions and I need to say everything I need even to say more than that whether there is an entry point and uh, an exit uh, point and which was the orientation of uh, the shot and the court even said that uh, they would send me the uh, NAT brigade to uh, collect the bullet it seems that nothing happened but in fact there was a fracture of uh, a few uh, ribs and uh, in lesions in many of the areas uh, of his body. And this case was a case that uh, impressed me a lot. Uh, we uh, had uh, uh, different uh, uh, projectiles. Uh, this was the case of a young man. The um, uh, guns were apprehended and it was the uh, mother uh, that uh, actually um, reported the situation. The same as far as this cat is concerned, uh, trauma to the head, uh, uh, abuse. Uh, please, uh, I'm not going to show you any further lesions. The most common one besides uh, uh, negligence is uh, poisoned uh, animals and uh, in that case or in, this is the diagnosis in this uh, um, case the flies would uh, uh, land on on the blood and would die instantly 
with regards to intoxication, I uh, resort to Annabelle, uh, the holder of this, the, the, the owner of this uh, animal, uh, who was somebody I knew. Um, the uh, house was uh, uh, robbed and the following day the animal was dead. This case is not part of cruelty, uh, you know, this was negligence, but here in this case is cruelty. This was not the animal, um, these are the cases of sexual abuse, they are um, actually very complicated and uh, these are cases that uh, we keep thinking about the whole uh, week and it is very important to actually um, make the link and uh, uh, here we have a ship uh, that was uh, raped uh, it died of uh, asphyxiated but uh, it died because it was uh, um, actually immobilized uh, by its neck I need to say whether uh, there were uh, any ex lesions exist on the neck of the animal and um, in this case you know in this uh, uh, geographical area there was a suspect of uh, uh, rape uh, um, in a woman and I confess that I decided to contact the authorities and see what I could do anything else uh, um, the gentleman uh, decided to actually um, uh, dump uh, five uh, young uh, uh, animals in in the uh, uh, garbage container and uh, this this was the uh, back where the uh, animals were, were were put we did uh, all the tests that we should have done to see whether they, they uh, uh, were still they were already dead and uh, uh, when these uh, came uh, to us there was a sentence of the court and this uh, uh, man had to pay 500 euro to a uh, animal association um, where the only animal that was still alive was uh, uh, received in this case this was uh, this case this this uh, cat was uh, um, a victim of an aggression by somebody that was part of the family uh, when we have uh, you know the link it will have a very important meaning uh, I found it difficult to understand uh, the cause of death you know some of these cases we really need to uh, study uh, what they mean in terms of uh, necropsy there is no uh, secret whatsoever and uh, I uh, you know this is evidence this is evidence of crime um, and it is uh, important to actually include that uh, that um, sentence at the end. These lesions are adequate uh, cause of death. The same thing for this um, animal, and uh, the importance of the report that needs to be done with the correct uh, uh, using the correct language. In this case, the um, owner did not have any identification and it was uh, said that the animal had been run over by a car and uh, the person just decided to pick it up and uh, uh, put it into the uh, uh, waste container aggression with objects this was a case that impressed me a lot and uh, talking uh, to uh, local people it was felt that the people the person that uh, um, perpetrated the aggression was known to the animal. This case was also uh, very impressing. The animal was killed and then he was uh, hanged by, by uh, pegs uh, 
in the uh, neighbor's uh, backyard. Uh, of course, the, the neighbor couldn't do this because he was uh, um, paraplegic, he was in bed, confined to bed. Uh, so my concern, as far as uh, a necropsy is concerned or not, I mean, it's uh, uh, different uh, uh, to say because he died of different hemorrhages and it, this was the case uh, where there was a concealment of uh, the animal uh, body. Uh, two uh, animals were allowed to um, go out for a walk uh, uh, one of them uh, returned home and the other one uh, did not return home. The cause of that is also evident, but uh, the um, lady thought that he uh, had been caught and buried alive. Uh, the lesions also um, were a result of, uh, um, of uh, internal hemorrhage. Those who report uh, are important, um, but we must also educate, educate in schools, because only by educating can we help with the reporting. We, um, myself and Justina, go to schools to talk to children uh, about this, and namely to very young children, and obviously giving it all a slightly different name, but what we want is to make sure that people aren't afraid to report. Our obligation is to educate and pass on these values. We have the medical knowledge, we have the medical veterinary knowledge. We are constantly improving. Uh, we have the system, we need the link. And a few years ago, I uh, embraced a new job, which is that of being a social uh, judge. And I try to uh, assess certain cases, cases where potential domestic violence is involved. We can have to do something. We can't just ignore stuff. We can help save lives. And this is taking and, and dealing with the problem head on. And by looking at animal welfare, we can detect a lot more things we have to give a voice to those who are victims of aggression. We have to be able to report, f flag situations which we consider of risk, and this is the moment to do so, Madam Ombudsperson. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Isabel and Justina. This time, Justina, you didn't have an active voice in the presentation. Nonetheless, I thank you ever so much for your con contributions. This is uh, um, an account of uh, the everyday life of uh, pathologists and often of many uh, veterinarians and uh, be a, the victim an animal or a person animals also tell their story and we must be open to listening to the story is there any question please you have the floor Good afternoon, Isabel. Thank you very much for your talk as a veterinarian. I'm very much aware of what you're talking about and what we see on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'd also like to ask you what the career of a uh, veterinarian pathologist is like, because we, we have a big problem in Brazil with that. We have 27 states in Brazil, and in certain states there are no 
uh, veterinarian pathologists. And when the police forces need a veterinarian to assist in the reporting, the uh, veterinarians normally just do this voluntarily and I normally go and assist in the forensic part of things and I'd like to know how it works in Portugal is it at a federal level is it per municipality will all veterinarians in clinical practice carry out autopsies there is a determination that they should be carried out in specific locations in uh, so at various institutes and universities and often we have to wait for a series of uh, financial requirements or financial funding uh, to be able to go ahead with certain um, autopsies but myself and Isabel don't wait for that financing we go ahead because we know that uh, time is of the essence so the European uh, specialty college has set up a forensic uh, pathology um, department and we basically learn from one another we as a result of the multidisciplinary team are able to learn from one another Justina could probably answer this in more detail because she has a master's well yes to say that specific training was uh, on our own account at one point in our lives we decided that uh, there was a specific niche that we wanted to address for which we had to be prepared to provide the adequate answer. I have a master's in forensic sciences and I used to conduct forensic work before I did bring to the table, as a result of my additional training, some more consistent forms of doing my work, establishing protocols in conjunction with others, and we have been building over the years. And my master's was in 2001, and since then we have been working in, let's say, a more consistent manner. But it has been a personal growth experience. There is no actual training per se uh, that allows you to say, well, now I am a forensic expert. There is no such thing. Any further questions? Thank you. Good afternoon. I'd like to begin by thanking all of your work and the fact that you came here to share it with us. And no matter how hard it is to listen to this and to look at these pictures, it's an awakening which is necessary and which mobilizes us even further to fight against these phenomena. My question is whether at any point in time in these uh, cases of domestic violence, whether the content of these autopsies, if the reports produced, whether they were used to enforce uh, the law and protect victims, whether there is any coordination between the work done in uh, forensic sciences and forensic pathology and its uh, impacts in the protection of victims. Well, in the case of the little, the kitten, it was the mother who reached out and uh, asks for, asked for help. Uh, but to be honest, I don't know uh, the follow-up. Um, today, I don't know, maybe in a year's time, we will be uh, able to give a different kind of response. 
let us move forward then and I'm sure that during the break which will probably a little bit be a little bit shorter we will be able to do some sort of networking and I will now continue with our uh, representatives from the uh, OPCs first of all uh, Ricardo Alves from GNR Sepna welcome and you may have the floor good afternoon following this uh, brilliant presentation which has left us let's say out of breath it's going to be harder to draw your attention but nonetheless thank you ever so much madam ombudsperson for the invitation and for organizing this seminar a seminar which uh, and a conference which we believe will uh, help to establish the mechanisms of what we're trying to fight against. And just to break the ice, I'd like to start off with a more holistic overview and not restrict the uh, talk to uh, just pets, household pets. We should also look at environmental crime and this is the trend at a European level and the European directive on environmental crime is being revised and one of the contributions we provided was an effective approach to uh, the specific area pertaining to pets that's uh, why SEPNA which covers a vast array of forms and areas of intervention amongst which household pets. These are just a few of the photos portraying the areas we're used to uh, working in and obviously pets are especially uh, relevant in terms of the progress that has been done because abuse towards and crimes towards animals were formally uh, entered into as uh, criminal acts in 2014. Often um, citizens feel a slight discomfort when it comes to uh, reporting situations but just to say that this tool uh, for reporting is around and has been around for a while and it allows for anonymous uh, reporting which is very important when we're talking about this specific kind of crime. Just to give you an idea of the potential here is that from the very onset it has grown exponentially and the last uh, year, last year it, we uh, reached more than 11,000 reports which were made of these 4,000 related to household pets obviously not all of them uh, are crimes many are just misdemeanors but then that assessment is done locally by our teams also to uh, recall statistics on environmental crime and solely at a national level and these are uh, glo the global figures 64 percent of our environmental uh, crimes are forest fires followed by 20 percent uh, the ill treatment and abuse of household pets it's something which is significant it's not just a an unimportant occurrence but 1% of uh, the more than 8,000 odd environmental crimes respond, correspond to uh, animal uh, abuse. When we talk about OPCs and in our case 80% of these environmental crimes were recorded. Now specifically when it comes to 
uh, household pets. This is a crime which we can call one of third, fourth generation. Uh, and the process began in 2014. The reason why the statistics presented here refer to the total full consolidated years, so as of 2015. And here we have seen a constant considerable increase of crimes committed against pets. We're reporting on um, abuse and abandonment. And if we break this down, and we have uh, some statistics here, which in terms of uh, ill treatment, uh, there is a very uh, steady trend. When it comes to abandonment, at which has uh, led, obviously, many people to be at home and to stay at home for longer periods, this tendency of abandonment actually dropped. I'd also say that uh, we have had um, a significant difference vis-a-vis -vis previous years. We used to have Lisbon, Porto and Stubal as the areas where main where most crimes were reported. And now uh, this uh, trend has disappeared from these three major areas. And we see now that other areas are equally reporting because now it is taken uh, more seriously in terms of something which has to be reported. When we talk about uh, the uh, profile of the aggressor, and now if we combine uh, ill treatment and abandonment, we see a trend also when it comes to the age bracket of the perpetrator and the aggressor. So from the age of 51 to 61, which also follows the international uh, tendency and trend when it comes to gender. The male gender is prevalent, 65%, whilst uh, females represent 30-odd uh, percent. It's also relevant to look at these figures in a more effective manner because these figures merely re correspond to the suspects. And this is just a statistic when it comes to potential suspects. Nationality-wise, Portugal is at the top of the list with uh, most cases of aggression at this level. If we move into uh, physical violence and domestic violence, it's what we see up here on the slide. Whilst the graph on the left-hand side represents the aggressor's age in terms of ill treatment and abandonment of animals. The second graph in the top right hand corner shows the age brackets for domestic violence of, of offenders and aggressors, and also the age bracket for uh, physical violence in general. There is a pattern. And clearly, the age bracket from 51 to 64 is the one which we should be focusing on primarily in order to be able to implement preventive and monitoring measures. Also, when it comes to gender, on the left uh, hand side, we can see the figures for pe 
ill treatment and abandonment of pets. And to the right of that, the uh, domestic violence uh, chart, which really follows suit in terms of the trend seen of a, in the aggression towards animals. And then we have what we call the hit map. This represents a potential in terms of police methodology, which is a way of increasing our surveillance and patrolling measures and direct them and target these services to the times when they're most and places where they're most required. And then we have here the topology of crime, the uh, probable time frame for this kind of uh, ill treatment, for instance. And that's also relevant not only for ill treatment, but for abandonment. And when we look at uh, the regional and the geographical impacts, we see the Lisbon and Stubal areas uh, with greater prevalence, followed by the Porto area. When we talk about the more inland areas, there's still a lack of uh, culture or maybe uh, still a lack of um, public opinion pressure. So there is uh, very little uh, culture in terms of and tradition of reporting. When we combine both ill treatment and abandonment, we see the geo-referencing and that makes it all the more important for us to be able to address and target our resources in terms of times and location. We are now trying to uh, improve, perfect and consolidate our approach by working together with public entities which ensure us greater proximity but also private entities which have occupied or taken up their very assertive role which uh, uh, in the public sphere needs to be filled in. So uh, zoophile associations, animal associations have a determining role when it comes to the needs for housing animals which are identified in the course of the, these different proceedings. We have also the society at large, scientific entities with the specific work they conduct, toxicological assessments have been fundamental partners when it comes to the investigative process and being able to reach out. You have one minute. Other innovations which we feel are beneficial, this has to do with the triage forms. We have a very detailed triage form and the means of proof. Also hugely uh, determining in this process. Our SEPNA teams are increasingly improving their proximity approaches so that they can more easily detect ill treatment and abuse towards animals. I'd like to recall the first case of Val Barige, which was the first major conviction we had. And then the last one more recently, of the 29th a case which took place in Viseu. And we need to report and echo this within the media, not just give animals a voice through their corpse, but also through these forms uh, of 
media. The abuse perpetrated against animals is often kept in secrecy and for adults it's important to give the victim a voice. And for the aggressor of pets, being referenced as a problematic citizen uh, is also an important aspect to bear in mind, plus sharing information so that we can carry out our work and better identify risk situations. Thank you very much, and I have, I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lieutenant Colonel. Now uh, we will move straight away to Commissioner Bruno Branco. We will not have time for questions, but uh, we will try to, uh, you know, do a bit of networking outside uh, over coffee. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. I promise to respect the time that was allocated to me. Uh, I believe that uh, we are all um, starving for coffee. I would like to thank on my personally and also in the name of my institutions, the uh, police, to um, actually uh, address this audience. I've uh, not yet uh, made my presentation, but this is something that I will take home with me and it will be part of our training program from now onwards because we don't need to have any uh, major Portuguese uh, scientific evidence, international evidence will be enough for us to um, move forward. I'm not, I will. Uh, uh, not follow my uh, presentation totally. I'll just uh, uh, briefly go through the uh, uh, beginning. Uh, but it is important to tell you uh, what uh, a little bit about the animal defense uh, program. This has been implemented in the metropolitan uh, region of Lisbon. It was started in uh, uh, 2014. The uh, our uh, environmental protection brigades are scattered uh, throughout the old region, and I'm the head of the uh, brigade for Lisbon. And uh, we've implemented this uh, um, animal defence uh, program that uh, manages any reports of uh, situations at national level, and then we provide training to. Uh, the members of the um, police uh, forces that uh, work in the field uh, daily. So, as I said, uh, we've started in 2015. Uh, initially, it uh, uh, should be only limited to the region of Lisbon, but uh, we uh, were, in a way, pushed by society to actually um, be present all over the country, and that is what happened. Um, we have uh, an email that is uh, known and a uh, hotline that provides support to all those that uh, want to uh, reach us. Uh, we also uh, are responsible uh, for the uh, training of those that uh, of owners of dangerous dogs in the metropolitan area of Lisbon, this was the first uh, campaign that we conducted, and we are uh, updating this campaign on a regular basis to make it available to an increasing number of people. We had success from the start and therefore we decided to uh, move to a second stage and that second stage had to do with uh, being uh, you know more present in the field and to um, attend to more reports uh, to the reports the increasing number of reports that was made to us so our brigades uh, depend on the uh, heads of the different uh, divisions in the Lisbon area, but we are in direct c contact with uh, um, these uh, units to help them if needed. 
the um, brigades will provide support in the field uh, so uh, that uh, these units may have a higher and more specialized support. They also allowed for the increment of the um, quality of the services that are delivered to citizens. The number of occurrences was so high that we had this need of implementing um, more uh, specialized teams in, in, uh, in the field. This is our map. We have Torres Vedras, uh, which is also part of our um, command. And in the five divisions uh, and the surrounding uh, counties, we have specialized teams and they uh, have um, a variable uh, number of elements and they themselves have uh, uh, been subject to a specific training that has been organized by the um, animal defense uh, program. The training that has been delivered to the police forces initially those that work uh, in the reports uh, on uh, pet abuse um, and I must say that we've started uh, yesterday a uh, third uh, training stage and in this case we decided to um, provide trainings to the elements of our uh, uh, patrol vehicles, so the first element that actually uh, responds to any situation uh, uh, needs to have specific training in the area of animal protection. And um, this is a training that uh, will uh, start this month and will continue throughout the year. Nevertheless, uh, we uh, have also uh, scheduled a new training for specialized teams in a more uh, specific manner um, so that they are uh, more enabled to act on the crime scene. Now, whenever we get a report, we make a triage and then the situation is uh, sent to the competent uh, authorities, uh, the situation is study, and uh, should an immediate intervention be uh, required that is determined uh, or whether we need to contact the uh, municipal veterinary and um, it is after that that we um, go to the field and um, act. We have a growing concern with uh, um, situations that uh, um, translate abuse. Uh, yesterday, my team um, was uh, called to respond to a report uh, on the situations involving uh, birds, and of course, we will. Uh, participate we will will uh, also um, alert the um, institution that is responsible for um, children because uh, you know this um, house was uh, full of dirt and there was a child living there and we feel this is also a growing concern that we have among the elements of our force that uh, attend to these situations. I was uh, uh, not familiar with the scientific evidence, but common sense and their concern to help um, their next, uh, the, the, their, uh, the other citizens is something that is very much uh, present. These are uh, pictures of some situations where I intervene, but when we speak of um, abuse and domestic violence, we need to keep present a few figures. Uh, the number of reports that we received uh, at our animal defense uh, program, we have a growing number of reports uh, of uh, crimes against pets uh, since uh, 2015. 
uh, crimes uh, reported against uh, um, our uh, force uh, since 2015 has remained high, always above 700 per year. And of course, I feel that I need to understand these uh, figures. And uh, the district of Lisbon uh, has uh, more than 2,700 reports um, for abuse uh, against pets. We also need to understand the impact that we have uh, in terms of uh, uh, courts and we have uh, a percentage of uh, uh, court uh, cases that uh, resulted in um, convictions and uh, of course we need to do uh, things in a better manner we need to improve the way we act uh, also the connection we have with the um, prosecutor services in terms of domestic violence and because we're speaking uh, of link it is important to understand the uh, crimes that have been reported to us in terms of domestic violence Although uh, 2020 and 2021 the figure uh, decreased, um, you know we have uh, uh, we do not have very uh, very good uh, uh, records, and uh, it is uh, here that we need to work on. And this is why it is important to understand the uh, this connection and this is the topic of this conference. The um, uh, and I also included uh, uh, crimes against assets because uh, uh, we have uh, situations in which the uh, stealing of animals results in the uh, abuse of animals and in sometimes uh, homicides and this is why I included it here because we need to understand whether an initial crime is going to have repercussions and. Um, we need also to understand what exactly are these repercussions in terms of domestic violence. The um, our record uh, regarding uh, risk reassessment also contemplates the uh, presence or not of uh, uh, physical violence against the members of the uh, file the the members of the family and also the whether uh, the family has or has not uh, pets now which are the major challenges uh, in this area first to understand and to identify the um uh, black uh, figures uh, meaning everything that is a crime that uh, occurs and that we are not aware of. This is important because this is uh, where we can actually um, have preve prevention uh, of crimes and solve conflicts and especially reduce the number of uh, victims, either animal or human. And we have many examples, uh, examples during the last years. Fireman kills cat to torture um, wife. A man does not accept the end of a relationship and kills cat. Um, so uh, these are examples of uh, situations in which the uh, pet is used to create some fear, some terror uh, on the side of the victim. And we also need to be attentive to this a multidisciplinary intervention intervention is required in these cases. Uh, we have many uh, news of this kind and uh, Annabella is uh, uh, asking me to uh, end so I'm totally uh, available to answer any question you may have. Uh, I don't have my email here, but I will be happy to, to give you my email uh, if you want. Thank you very much for your attention. Obrigado, Comissário Bruno Branco. Bom, chegamos.
Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. We unfortunately will conclude this session without uh, time for questions. I would invite you all to go uh, for a coffee break, but I'd also like to thank my uh, fellow members of this session because this is a way of giving voice to those who don't have one at various levels from psychologists to veterinarians to be able to ascertain be it in a living animal or unfortunately in deceased animals uh, the causes of their injuries and I think we're all really on the same uh, ship all heading towards uh, the fight against and doing our utmost to uh, work at this level to be able to solve these problems so we shall all go for coffee break how long for coffee break 15 minutes okay so we shall all now break for 15 minutes thank you
Bem. Já está. Não, já está, já está. Boa tarde. Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. Hopefully after the coffee break we will be revived and we are going to start this uh, session. With uh, not only uh, the the link as such. Oh, and I must I must say before I start that being a moderator is dangerous. And that's why we, they've put us together. But it's a huge struggle um, towards uh, the single uh, security approach. So I will now allow for the speakers to be introduced. During this uh, second uh, session this afternoon, we will have the Public Prosecutor's Office perspective with the Public Prosecutor Eunice Merslino, who from 2015 to 2016 served as head of the Specialized Units in Crimes Against Animals at the, the DR. IAP of the Court of Stubal, currently placed in the local criminal court of the same area. Followed by and according to uh, our agenda, we have Manuel Albanu, who has a degree in social services and he's also Vice President of the Commission for Citizenship and Gender Equality, known as the CIG, since October 2020. Then we will have uh, Danielle Coutrin, psychologist and also a member of uh, the APAV, uh, where he is an advisor and an instructor. Then we will have Dulce Rocha, who um, is a retired president of the Child Support Institute and prosecutor. So I'd now like to pass the floor to our first speaker, Eunice Merslino, public prosecutor. Good afternoon to all. I would like to, as you would expect, thank the invitation addressed by Madam uh, Ombudsperson for the invitation uh, to be here today. Following so many illustrious and interesting speakers, all I can really add to with my presentation is in a certain way just repeat what has been said to stress the need to raise awareness for the topic and obviously the common goal is the link and the link which was so uh, well presented by um, Phil Arco also the problems in Brazil and uh, which are common to many other countries even if the legal frameworks are slightly different and obviously as a result of that 
the investigation process within each crime will also have its variations, but the kind of crimes being investigated are very similar. And thank you very much once more for having been invited uh, to come here because um, this is something which I um, need find a need to talk about, uh, although I am by nature a rather pessimistic person. I supported some of my uh, uh, work uh, and on a book written by uh, someone who wrote on the abuse towards children. And the, this um, is very similar to uh, what uh, serves as a foundation for a lot of the victim protection institutes. This reports back to a case in 1874, a child who was found incarcerated at home with clear signs of malnutrition and she was uh, removed from this house via the assistance of the Animal Protection Society, uh, which had been founded round about that time as well. And the only grounds to be able to remove the child from that house was uh, alleging that she was also part of the animal kingdom. So there was no association established up until then that could uh, intervene to assist the child. And all the, the authorities, the police authorities and so on, had failed in their attempt. And this was the way that was found by this animal protection association to actually be able to extract the child from this circumstance and from these conditions. Obviously, nowadays this would be absolutely um, unheard of that that would have been the solution. But we have nonetheless, throughout the course of the 20th century, seen a lot of setbacks at various levels, namely in terms of animal protection. There was a general law that was sanctioned free concerning uh, aggressions towards animals. There are also EU directives which enforced uh, more restrictions. However, they weren't really applied because there was no surveillance or monitoring. But thanks to the spirit and commitment and resilience primarily of uh, animal protection associations, we were able to get to a point where society is more aware of the severity of these crimes and the need to prevent them. And in 2014, finally, we saw the uh, crime uh, established uh, in the law for abuse towards animals. So we need to protect victims at uh, different levels. And if investigating crimes is difficult, protecting victims is difficult, actually doing something simultaneously, and especially for those who are the first responders following a, a reported case, the criminal police, even harder is the task despite how co ever uh, committed uh, all those involved are. And then it reaches us, the public prosecution, all of the cases which are reported by people, by the police authorities, by the uh, doctors, veterinarians, as well as all sorts of other crimes such as domestic violence and if a municipal uh, veterinary doctor within even if within the scope of a an inspection for instance or within the scope of uh, a suspected lack of uh, 
well-being or any other crime or the suspicion of crimes perpetrated against children or any other form of domestic violence is legally obliged to report it. But often when reaching um, the location uh, where there are suspected crimes, at a home where there is a couple who has just been in, in a fight uh, with children and it's always uh, very difficult for the police force intervening to establish priorities, safety and security of uh, all involved, uh, ensuring that uh, proof can be an evidence can be collected and we often wonder why things weren't done differently in so many cases where these things didn't go in the best way possible but we also know the constraints and difficulties which are encountered as you all know it's the public prosecutor's office which um, is responsible for determining the agents involved in a crime and recovering uh, evidence. We often know that a crime has been committed, we collect evidence, but we don't know who committed those crimes, what happens with abandonment, uh, ill treatment, abuse, uh, poisoning. And in others, we're able to find, for instance, uh, the necessary evidence and proof which leads to an identification of those who perpetrated the crime. But ultimately, we end up concluding that it can't be considered a crime for one reason or another. And very often, we come across very frustrating situations. And so the public prosecution has to ensure the investigation and has to uh, provide protection for the victim. And in Portugal, uh, the concept of a victim of a crime is very recent, but does not contemplate an animal as a victim. It talks about people. It talks about youth or children who experience situations, namely those of domestic violence, within the concept of and definition of victim, and I'd like to highlight this, uh, uh, it de describes a specially vulnerable victim, one whose a special vulnerability is a result of age, health condition, or specific disability and if, as a result, severe consequences uh, have um, been incurred. But if we're talking about an animal, dependent, fragile, namely the ones we've been talking about up until now, could fall under this category in general terms, but not for now, at least from a legal standpoint, although we also treat an animal as a victim because not only do we have to retrieve animals often, treat them or in more severe cases obviously conduct autopsies. But we have progressed considerably since 2014. Unlike other countries where this was already a crime, we have gone a little bit further. No animal is considered or can be any longer considered an object or a thing as it was before. Unfortunately, we have also progressed considerably when in our civil code uh, we it states that animals are living beings of, uh, with the sensitivity and they are entitled and, ob and subject to legal protection as a result of their nature. Victims often don't speak, as is the case for animals. Many victims of domestic violence may say something at the beginning, but then often fall into absolute silence. 
The elderly also have difficulty in voicing their problems because sometimes and often they suffer from dementia and other mental conditions. And so collecting evidence is very often the only way we have to prove aggression and ill treatment. We have had many shocking accounts of uh, domestic violence and the relationship between these different kinds of violence as well. These are some examples of real cases. This is an account of a lady whose husband, a hunter who had a lot of firearms, she ended up going to a shelter. She was heard, her testimony was heard uh, through video recording because she was frightened her husband would find out her location. She moved abroad with her son and she uh, stated that her husband used to just beat animals to death and in one particular case uh, she had to put the sound of a TV up so loud because a dog that he beat to death just made so much uh, crying noise uh, that it was impossible to stand and the husband threatened her with doing even worse to her seeing as she wasn't willing to listen to the um, suffering screams of the dog. So we're talking about obviously a clear case of domestic violence. Uh, we have another case of domestic violence uh, where uh, the uh, woman moves away with uh, the children and pets and the uh, former partner breaks into her new home, kidnaps the pet and uses it as a form of threat. And the lady did not get in touch with him. This isn't a common aggressor in the sense that um, the dog or the animal um, became hungry, the aggressor didn't uh, have the means to go and buy food and just took him to uh, a shelter, um, which is a rare situation when we talk about this kind of behavior. This is an excerpt uh, uh, from a court decision, um, a, a case in uh, the Alentejo, the kidnapping of uh, underage children, and he was convicted for that and aggressions and abuse towards animals. He appealed, the um, conviction stood, and these are the facts. He had two children child A and D and the uh, family received a dog uh, within the residence and the father used a rope to hang the dog and this was done in the presence uh, in, of child A and then requested that child E bag the dog and throw him out when no one was looking. This is also a, a way of uh, acknowledging that uh, people were aware that they were obviously perpetrating aggressions uh, towards animals. One of the, chil the children, one of them had Asperger's, for instance, and the other one was even uh, younger, but nonetheless, they were forced 
to witness and carry out these acts. It was very difficult to um, recover proof from uh, these uh, crimes. Often the children were either witnesses or victims of um, the aggressions and abuse perpetrated by uh, the father or by the aggressor in this case. So many ill treatments and abuse and aggressions were carried out within this context. We have already mentioned this here, and actually Commissioner Bruno brought this up, that today we don't see domestic violence as we saw it in the past. Many uh, police authorities actually often told the victims that uh, one doesn't meddle in the affairs of a couple. And likewise, when anyone reported an aggressive uh, or missive behavior towards an animal, a repeated, uh, long-lasting one, the procedure was the same. People would just say, well, why am I going to bother just to go over for a dog? I don't have transportation. I, I don't have any way of collecting or retrieving the animal. Just ask for an animal association to go and deal with it. And when, in terms of proof, when the 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 um, situation was reported, there wasn't even an animal to um, present as proof uh, of the victim. And in terms of domestic violence, also one of the items when you fill out the the um, form or uh, and the report. Uh, on domestic violence is to inquire whether there are not only children but also animals residing. And this data has never been properly uh, treated in order to understand how this correlates and how situations are dealt with subsequently and what's the fate of animals in these cases. Then we have the RVD2L form which also asks about uh, violence uh, towards others within the household. So the behavior of the victims has uh, been mentioned before. We've mentioned the uh, existence of shelters, uh, also alternative uh, uh, homes for these um, uh, people that are victims of uh, vast, uh, domestic violence. Um, and these are available um, outside office hours and uh, uh, also sometimes when somebody has an alternative place to stay, you know, belonging to parents or a friend, but they do not uh, tolerate because in the uh, regulation of the premises, um, uh, the permanence of, of uh, uh, animals in those premises is forbidden. But, um, you know, so therefore there's in fact a real difficulty with this regard that we need to solve. And I believe that uh, this issue that uh, was uh, addressed by almost all the participants, almost all the speakers, that is uh, common to all countries, we know that there is a um, manual of procedure which is in fact a handbook that is an excellent uh, uh, means of work for uh, police, uh, uh, criminal police bodies, and that is what uh, uh, they need to do uh, whenever um, domestic violence is reported. And it would be important that uh, this uh, manual is uh, revised so as to also 
include all the um, different situations that were mentioned here with regards to um, uh, pets because as you know it abbreviates the uh, time of uh, violence vis-a-vis -vis, uh, people and also obviously vis-a-vis -vis animals I don't think that as uh, Marie de Sao said um, the police uh, forces should not uh, uh, try to get in touch with uh, an animal association um, because the uh, animal shelters are uh, overcrowded. Um, I believe that we should have an emergency hotline, you know, for this kind of um, emergencies that uh, is uh, created expressly for the effect and that is uh, fully operational as well. Um, I'm close to the end of my presentation, says the speaker. Now, uh, the um, duration of all these cases in court are much uh, longer. This is, uh, I'm not really um, used uh, to being so fast. I'm, I apologize for that. Um, but um, raising awareness uh, for these situations uh, is something that uh, we already have uh, mobilizing people and means I believe uh, uh, can be improved and the intervention needs to be a, a joint one and also an articulated one the uh, Brazilian translation for a task uh, uh, force we know that uh, Brazilian citizens uh, uh, find it very easy finding um, a translation for things, you know, and uh, their translation for a task force uh, means um, that there is a will. And if it is not a joint um, intervention, um, things not will not work out in practical terms. So here we have, um, usually this is you know the the policeman that actually um, has to respond to a situation and um, has to take care of, of the victim uh, we need to shorten the times of apprehension of animals and uh, uh, I with regards to suggestions um, we know, according to the most recent news from the Constitutional Court, we know that soon the uh, crime of uh, uh, pet abuse uh, will no longer be part of the penal code, but violence against animals will continue and we will uh, still have uh, misdemeanors. And um, this makes no sense, uh, but. Uh, was what has been decided uh, and these are the suggestions we need to have prevention plans uh, uh, against uh, uh, individual protection including protection of animals the creation of practical um, uh, guide to, in order to intervene in case of uh, violence against animals um, such as the one that we have uh, against the abuse of children, a uh, creation of a database of uh, um, penalties by uh, due to crimes against uh, animals. Um, unfortunately, those that have uh, uh, abused uh, animals can adopt, uh, continue to adopt animals. Uh, to elaborate a practical um, manual uh, for situations of violence against animals. This has not been done and I would like to insist that uh, uh, we don't need to wait for a mandate uh, from the uh, prosecutor department uh, whenever there is a situation that is urgent. Uh, we need to have uh, uh, lines to respond to this type of, of, of crimes and uh, of course uh, these emails need to have special fields as any um, complaint 
should should have as the electronic complaint or report of uh, um, crime situations. Um, we should include this topic in the training of uh, the bodies of criminal police, uh, also in the scope of uh, um, uh, the Safe School uh, Project. And we should have a joint action um, and, and uh, emergent responses, not only with regards to um, homes, and also um, the elderly that uh, uh, sometimes uh, suffer violence from their old children uh, that abuse alcohol uh, and and sometimes they they uh, will uh, go to um, uh, care centers and they cannot take their their pets with them And this is in, in some way uh, contributes uh, to the uh, protection of, of uh, the animal and also um, for the health of the owner of the animal. Um, and also, as I said, the treatment of um, the domestic violence risk records so that we can, at last, and I've heard about the uh, link uh, since 2015, uh, today, uh, it has become real, and I believe that in practical terms it will uh, be even more real. And uh, thank you very much for the organization of this venue. And uh, this uh, brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Now we would like to give the floor to the next speaker, Mr. Manuel Albano. Is uh, uh, representing uh, um, SIG, the national network uh, that supports victims of uh, domestic violence. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and uh, thank you very much, dear colleagues uh, uh, of the panel. I must say that I did not prepare uh, a structured presentation uh, to deliver uh, to you, but um, I will try not to use uh, the amount of time that was allocated to me, but I will try to share with you some reflections that I feel are important. Now, first of all, SIG belongs to um, the um, public um, services that uh, includes the uh, that is responsible for the coordination of victims of uh, domestic violence. This network contemplates about 200 and something institutions that act uh, in the territory in different areas. In the area of uh, responding to situations and also in the, um, the protection uh, of uh, victims, protection in the um, uh, meaning emergency um, uh, response and uh, uh, also shelter homes. And we have uh, with us a representative of APAV, which is one of the institutions that also manages this uh, types of uh, response besides the uh, other types of, of situations that uh, um, the organizations uh, promote in terms of uh, raising awareness and uh, capacity building. This network has grown exponentially and uh, myself, Daniel and Dulce uh, and um, we've been working in this specific area for many years and we've seen that uh, um, there has been this this network has uh, uh, grew during the years and uh, uh, when I um, when we started working, you know, the intervention, uh, the, 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 uh, you know, the things that were mentioned by the colonel um, before the coffee break did not exist. Um, 
And the same goes for uh, what the uh, commissioner uh, said. That kind of uh, operation did not exist. Uh, you would not be able to speak about uh, these uh, topics when, when we started a long time ago. So the victim did not exist, um, be it an animal or a person. Uh, victim of uh, domestic violence. This did not exist and it was uh, through consistent and uh, work and perseverance of many of the um, uh, public organizations, human rights uh, institutions that we achieved what we have here today. It has been um, a long way, a hard uh, way, but uh, uh, most likely we are here today discussing the uh, link between uh, domestic violence associated to animal abuse and the kind of actions and policies that we need to implement to actually uh, be more attentive and uh, protect both uh, situations and how they can uh, be seen as uh, indicators that uh, there is uh, a violence and uh, that there is abuse uh, of uh, pets or um, people. Also how animal associations, whenever they identify that there is an animal that is abused, what is the link, what is the um, competences that uh, the uh, staff of the association um, to understand that uh, the situation regarding that uh, animal and they need to understand that there is a strong possibility that uh, in that family there, there might also be a victim of uh, domestic violence. So this is uh, um, a capacity that uh, needs to be uh, created and uh, uh, obviously the services need to keep in their uh, pattern, in their pattern of uh, risk assessment, they need to identify uh, the existence of uh, violence, uh, the existence of abuse of both animal and uh, uh, women. I didn't have the opportunity to uh, listen to what uh, uh, Xina said this morning, um, but um, I'm sure that uh, you mentioned uh, this and how we can um, overcome the situation. Now, if uh, well, this growth of the national network has try to promote a relationship of proximity involving all the agents that uh, um, are responsible in a given uh, area uh, and that means all of us, uh, the organ public organizations or uh, civil society organizations and uh, it is for this purpose that we are here today and we need to act in a manner that we involve the associations in charge of human of uh, animal protection, as the prosecutor um, said, and we need to find joint solutions between these two um, actors, uh, because to uh, a to respond in Lisbon is not uh, something as uh, responding in, in uh, Beja, Evra, Merced Cavaleiros, or Vila Real. The concept may be identical, but uh, the what we do has got to be adapted to um, the local situation. So maybe it's time to start to use in our response, uh, or start to use A certain capacity to, to to involve associations that have that are recognized by their good practices in those territories. Um, 
I said that have recognized practices uh, or good practices uh, on purpose because it's always uh, um, that because the uh, process of certification of the uh, national network to respond to the victims of uh, domestic violence is uh, about to be concluded. But as I was saying, we need to understand and also to certify these organizations and uh, in a way guarantee a certain seal of quality uh, that we also need to have uh, with regards to the protection of uh, animals. We can't uh, run the risk of having situations that last less pleasant. This uh, is a bit as uh, what happened with uh, domestic violence. Uh, it started out of volunteer work, uh, but today that is not accepted. Um, this work uh, can be voluntary work, uh, but it has got to be a professional one. Um, people need to be trained. Um, And uh, we need to uh, build capacity in people that uh, work in these areas. And the um, associations that defend animals also have to be um, trained. And the responsibility lies not doesn't lie only on the um, state, but also on civil society organizations and they need to uh, get organized in order to find the best uh, response possible. Ana Martinho helped me a lot and helped us a lot uh, creating this and uh, we tried to elaborate a protocol uh, that provides an answer to the longings of associations. Uh, we need to discuss um, the situations with uh, regards to um, uh, animals uh, and uh, this needs to be considered. We need to find solutions that need to um, result from joint work from uh, associations that defend uh, uh, animals, uh, that support uh, victims and uh, this can not uh, lead to um, the um, victimization of both animals or uh, people. We need, uh, therefore, to uh, be objective and provide the best uh, answer possible uh, in these uh, two areas. Now, while we, we try to uh, provide a response in this area and uh, we are working together with two uh, municipalities um, and whenever there are situations in uh, which we need to uh, provide uh, a pet, uh, a shelter to a pet uh, as a result of uh, um, abuse, we uh, know how animals sometimes are uh, used against victims and uh, municipalities uh, uh, need to be able to, in fact, receive these animals, provide them a comfortable place to live and uh, uh, especially um, provide uh, places where they can stay uh, together with their owners. Now, uh, concerning animal ship, uh, ships, uh, well, they are very important and then they assign um, the um, ownership to a person and that ownership uh, can in fact uh, lie on the aggressor and uh, we can in a way solve the situations but we need to rethink this and of course um, you uh, will be in the best position to uh, actually um, think about this or rethink this, situ this situation and uh, 
one should not uh, uh, question the importance of uh, animal um, centers. I conclude with this, and I'm available. Um, we are available, SIG, as coordinator of the network, uh, in order to find the best response possible to protect both animals and people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We were able to recover two minutes. We will leave questions to the end. All of the speakers will be here at the very end, so we can ask the questions at the end of all of the speakers. I was discussing with uh, Eunice uh, this uh, matter. We are not uh, uh, allowing for questions, thanks. We'll have an opportunity further along. So now we will have uh, Mr. Kutri, who will be talking about the framework of domestic violence and the role of the APAV in Portugal, the Portuguese Association for Victim Support. I'd like to begin by thanking the invitation by uh, Madam Ombudsperson, the, and I'd like to greet all of the colleagues and members of the panel and both moderators. So I've only just realized that, we're to, that there are two. And please do not uh, take it the wrong way, but uh, just correct the name of the association, which has a mistake in Portuguese. Okay, so I would just like to ask you, please, if I do start to go over the time, to just uh, let me know, throw a shoe at me, if you must. Obviously, a lot has been said today, and I run the grave risk of repeating what others uh, have said, wise women and men, involved in this fight now for many years. We are here to talk about, and if I may, just to give you some background to the topic, which is a panel, and in this case, the panel on giving victims a voice. Do we want to give victims a voice or is the, the important thing to actually give them a louder voice? Because the victims haven't lost their voice, but they need people to amplify their voices so that uh, they have a different reach. This is an example of a campaign launched by the um, association and it uh, was a very posit good campaign actually, it was right, right, uh, right to the point really. So um, domestic violence often feels like a boxing ring and this has many phrases here and one of them is when I tell my story I get a feeling that people don't believe me so people have voices but we need to get uh, their voices out there There's a book by a journalist, A Punch in the Stomach. He uh, joined our efforts at the association and uh, funnily enough, he works for the Ministry of Environment. He can't be here now because he is assisting with the closing ceremonies at the um, Oceans Conference at UNOC. And he... Uh, 
is with this book, A Punch in the Stomach, Amplifying Victims' Voices. And so all of us have a role to play, the, the, those of us who work directly with victims, courts, journalists, they can all have a role to play. What APAV did about a week ago uh, was celebrate its 32nd anniversary and it has supported in its history more than 360,000 people. And when we zoom in and look at the 360,000 people which have been supported over the course of 32 years, this figure is uh, quite considerable. We have been able to set up 75 proximity services, many individual support, uh, victim support offices. We have the shelter network and many other things. And when we look at all of these figures, suddenly we come to 2021 and we see that the number of um, cases uh, reported to the association, to APAV, we see that figures increased in 2021. We supported around 75,000 people. And when we zoom in even further, around 93% of victims of crimes and 76% or 76.8% of people requesting help are victims of domestic violence. And uh, they have suffered solely according to Article 152, ill treatment, both at a physical and psychological level. And we're not even including other things which may fall under other categories such as abuse uh, to animals or any other. And when we look at the percentages of the uh, perpetrators, the aggressors, 87% are males, 74 between the ages of 25 and 54 women, victims 85% are women, 67 between, percent between the ages of 25 and 54. And so what is violence about? Violence and the concept of violence. Violence is any uh, form of intentional use of uh, force. Um, it, it's a, an attempt to have power and control and this power and control is also exerted through pets. It's nothing new. It's not a new technique used by aggressors. It's a very old technique. And it's described in the literature. Psychopaths, serial killers, start to practice their skills and improve their skills on pets. Pets are often used by the aggressor to exert power and often what happens is that pets are used to control, dominate, intimidate the victims. The roots of violence in intimate contexts, it's also important to talk about this, the imbalances in, of power, the figures show us this, but when we try and break this down, we see primarily 85% uh, of women as the main uh, victims. We live in a male chauvinistic society, power is not adequately shared and all 
of us are educated within this context, this uh, imbalance of power. And domestic violence is not a cultural thing. I'm sure that this is something which has been said before to, to you, but it's a public crime. It's something that has to be dealt with in the same way that we had to wear masks during the pandemic. Domestic violence is not a pandemic, but it's endemic. It lives amongst us and we have to help bring down these scary figures and it's the concern of all of the people sitting there. This, these are, this is part of their major concerns. Social and cultural vulnerability. Being a victim of domestic violence increases this uh, social vulnerability. And then it's obviously a violation of human rights. Human rights are not a privilege of all. They are a representation of a signed document ratified by all, but they're not put into practice 24-7. And then we have the impact of the media. We see how violence, and especially domestic violence, is portrayed um, and how the privacy of people is um, exposed through the media and we become numb to it. We become fed up of it, not because we don't think it's bad or it bothers us, but because it, it, it just annoys us because it is um, shown when we want to have a meal and so on and so forth. So there is some desensitization when it comes to these topics through overexposure. So what are reactions uh, of victims when they're being victimized? They use uh, denial, they use anger and rage. And they, go, they tend to resort to negotiation, often fall into depression. People have self-destructive behaviors and often uh, then there is the stage of transition when a victim has a perception of the risks incurred and finally an acceptance and some control is taken back. What are the typical reactions? It depends uh, on the stage at which they are. And what's studied uh, today, and once more it brings us to the link with animal abuse, is uh, the different stages, so during, immediately after, or during the following days, there are different kinds of uh, reactions. So one goes from panic and not knowing how to leave a violent relationship but when considering leaving a relationship they come across a reality check which is the fact that they have pets and what to do with pets. For psychology and the a, a pet is a member of the household of the family and uh, it's, uh, it's a family member that one wouldn't leave behind. So it's crucial in the work which is carried out and echoing Manuel Albano's words, we need to work in a network because the answers to these problems and questions 
have to be coordinated and all of those who are also responsible for animal rights must be involved. The cycle of violence, we're all familiar with it, the phase of the violent attack, the uh, soothing phase which is the honeymoon and then the phase of uh, tension. And then you could ask, well, why do people just stay? They stay out of fear, shame, um, fear of losing their children, economic, emotional dependency, religious beliefs and so on. We all have this uh, experience in the field. I've seen dramatic situations of mothers who, because a the cat was left behind, go back. And we know that the risk will be increased after the return. But the cat is an emotional support for the children. And this isn't a story uh, which... Uh, happened yesterday it was a a story that happened 20 years ago so this lady went back home because of this and what happened well she continued to be a victim of violence and then this uh, trinity this holy trinity trinity which is hope fear love believing that tomorrow will be a better day so fear, fear of something happening, fear of not being able to protect all of those around me. And then this notion of love, love which is bizarre and weird. People who work with domestic violence victims recognize this strange sort of love, a love which is not something that you can describe with words and that has a lot within it it has fear the need to escape but not knowing how i'm sure that uh, the experiences of people like Mauro Paulino mentioned, uh, obviously in a very encompassing way, um, the the actual actions of abuse towards animals, which you are all familiar with, and the use of animals as a means to enact violence. For instance. Uh, There are cases, and there is a case, where the children were petrified that the dog had been killed uh, because the dog had disappeared. And that was a way of making sure that the mother would not leave. And only when she swore that she would not leave him, did the dog resurface. So the victims have more likelihood of suffering psychologically and the figures stem from international studies. We know that in Portugal, mental health is the uh, poor relative in health. And we know the difficulties in getting emotional, psychological support. And in cases where people have pets, and here is the link. This may be a source of support and assistance in terms of mental health. This is not obviously the solution for mental problems in Portugal. It does not solve the lack of uh, professionals working in, in um, mental health issues or the lack of resources but in some situations it can be a driver for greater collaboration between people within the support system within the legal proceedings also networking and I'm virtually coming to an end 
v networking and the importance of it. Manuel Albenu spoke about this as did the prosecutor. It's, this networking is fundamental. Working in a, a network is crucial so that everyone involved knows all of the details. Fundamental for all of those working one side and the other have the necessary training, skills, understand fully what this is all about, understand the needs of animals and for this we must work within a network. We have to know one another and therefore I congratulate what's happening here today because it brings us together. So what we need is a similar system to what we have in our association which is a victim support system. So we can add to our association and add to collaboration and referencing all sorts of other victim support organizations and that's obvious but we must think about how. We have to structure this accordingly. We must all feel comfortable at the end of the day with the solution. We cannot be hopping from one project to another, from one pilot experiment to another, from one source of financing to another. We need something to create stability and something which is quick providing quick, efficient responses. We love to just meet and get together to discuss things in Portugal. Obviously, thinking about things allows us to reduce the stress levels, but it's important to act. And I always like to end this way. Violence, whatever the way in which it manifests itself, is always a defeat. I've been working for 21 years in this field and I sometimes feel or often feel that we are losing the battle. So we need you all in order to be able to win this battle. Thank you so much for your attention and once more congratulations for the event. And now we move to the last speaker of this uh, session, um, Prosecutor Dulce Rocha. She is the um, chair of the Child Support Institute. Good afternoon. I see that some people are leaving the room and uh, that means that I need to be um, quick. Um, you know that the fact, you know, being the last person to, to speak also has an advantage. Uh, uh, and on top of that, uh, you know, um, Eunice spoke uh, about a few things that I uh, had in mind to share with you. But, uh, well, I just thought that it would be a good idea to emphasize some of the ideas that were mentioned throughout this day. Uh, this last one, you know, the issue of networks, the need to create partnerships, I think that uh, that is very important. But before that, I would like to uh, thank the Ombudswoman. I believe uh, um, this is a very important initiative. It's an honor for me to be here, especially at a time uh, when we, we had, you know, the third uh, uh, statement of uh, in in, in constitutionality of the law of uh, 2014. I know that you are concerned with that. Uh, um, in fact, our constitution speaks of uh, uh, personal integrity, human uh, dignity. It speaks mainly about uh, the right to human life. Um, and uh, when people that do not understand that this is a uh, priority matter, they um, 
try to uh, actually um, hold on to these uh, formalities and most likely we'll have to change the constitution in order to uh, be able to, to continue to use the law of 2014. This was a landmark because we all uh, recognized that uh, we needed to condemn uh, the abuse of animals that it could not just be um, punished with a misdemeanor that it had to be considered a crime and uh, in fact we did not have a law I mean I remember uh, going to the national parliament at, parliament at that time it was an important element we did not have the party of uh, animals and nature um, in the uh, parliament um, uh, Peter North and Pedro Delgado Alves uh, were the heads of this uh, uh, battle and in fact it was something of extraordinary. I mean all the activists and humanists uh, that uh, are concerned with other living beings and not only with human beings we felt that uh, this uh, was an extraordinary thing and this setback this uh, three declarations of being unconstitutional we cannot allow this to um, go back to be refused i mean of course we will count on the uh, ombudswoman with uh, all those that are in the room and uh, those that are with us uh, uh, remotely because uh, ngos have are very important when it comes to uh, lobbying and uh, i've seen this uh, um, for children, for instance, uh, whenever we discuss laws, um, uh, NGOs are um, a call to the scene and we uh, contribute not only to improve some of the uh, legislation, um, but um, we are actually able to uh, further explain certain needs and we can in fact convince uh, uh, the legislator uh, better because of this proximity that we have to situations. And uh, after hearing uh, to the teacher of the University of Trasmunt, I uh, felt that it is via initiatives of this type that we can uh, raise awareness among people to um, reprove 100% the abuse of animals. Daniel Coutry was uh, uh, quoting Jean-Paul Sartre and that is a very important thing, you know, uh, all types of violence is unacceptable and we need to eradicate um, violence. Obviously this is a difficult uh, task but this uh, topic of, of the link, you know, this is something that is uh, uh, highly difficult it is uh, painful but uh, it is a real thing um, I am now retired but uh, during my professional life I saw um, you know many times this connection this dark connection between the uh, cruelty against animals and if it is practiced during childhood until the age of, of uh, uh, 10, 11 years, well, uh, most likely uh, during adolescence uh, that will result in the bullying uh, uh, or even violence against the younger children. These are people that uh, do not have any empathy vis-a-vis um, -vis animals and they do not have empathy vis-à-vis -vis their peers and uh, later on they um, abuse their children uh, you know they slap them for instance now in our institute uh, of child support of the child support institute we have a campaign against uh, slapping children and you know um, this is something that uh, occurs in in, uh, in the homes of people and uh, 
this type of violence uh, and also the type of violence against animals especially at an early age has a lot of consequences uh, Paulino uh, mentioned uh, several issues uh, along these lines and uh, in serial killers we've seen that uh, we've seen this link um, these are people that uh, at an early stage in their life had uh, experienced episodes of uh, cruelty against animals so I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that we need to insist a lot um, in the issue of training training um, technicians uh, the training of uh, uh, also uh, children uh, in school our institute was started in 1983 and our uh, the convention goes back to 80 uh, dates uh, or uh, was enacted in 1989 we have an article on education that uh, states that children are entitled to free education compulsory and free education but then there is article 29 I like to read some parts of it uh, it says the, the, it, it is agreed that the education of children should be aimed at promoting development of the child and also to um, build the idea of uh, respect for human rights, uh, respect for parents, uh, national values. I'm not reading everything, uh, otherwise we would stay here all day long. Uh, prepare children to uh, uh, accept responsibilities in the spirit of uh, understanding peace, tolerance, uh, gender equality, friendship among other peoples and ethnical groups and promote the respect of children uh, for the environment. So these last um, aspects, you know, concerning um, environment, uh, we can um, mention, you know, this issue of uh, animals and even Sapna and we have the colonel over there uh, I actually uh, uh, had more work together with Sapna at the end of my career and I uh, really uh, got to know you know the uh, the many um, crimes against the environment and our agents our, our officers uh, you know, sometime uh, with a lot of, of, of uh, uh, while it was raining and uh, uh, you know it was uh, cold and, and they just had to go and find um, where waste had been dumped uh, in uh, uh, small rivers and so on. And you know this uh, department of, of uh, Guarda Nacional Republicana brought together, you know, animals and the defense of the environment. And of course, we need to um, build this idea of respect for animals uh, among children. We need to uh, see their reactions. And another important aspect is that one should uh, assess uh, risks. And unfortunately, during the last week, I was asked to uh, uh, call to to speak to several um, uh, newspapers uh, because of, of of Jessica, the young girl that was uh, uh, murdered, and I assisted in the assessment of risk. Uh, we sometimes neglect this. We neglect the uh, psychological assessment of families we need to have a psychological assessment of the situation and I'm sure Sophia Neves will agree with me because if we do not assess the uh, effective relationship uh, uh, in a family we will be missing something and sometimes when we do that 
uh, when we carry out that uh, psychological assessment, we see that there is something there that is not visible to the uh, eyes of those that are less attentive to this situation. So we need, first of all, cooperation, lots of cooperation. Um, among the different institutions. It doesn't matter whether uh, we're speaking about uh, uh, private or public institutions. What is important is that uh, NGOs that work 24-7 um, always have somebody available. And uh, APAV has uh, one um, 116, 111. We need to know exactly to whom we should report. If you don't want to um, report situations to um, police uh, uh, forces, you can um, denounce uh, situations uh, to NGOs. NGOs play a very important, a fundamental role and uh, animal associations can in fact be part in the legal procedures while the law is uh, still um, valid and um, it is important that we um, know that we are not alone the state is not alone and NGOs are not alone and that uh, this new office that now exists and that is uh, an office we uh, we are uh, we look uh, uh, this 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 uh, new organization means that we are in the right uh, uh, on the right track and uh, together with animal associations we will be able to overcome some difficulties uh, that seem to be very big at uh, first sight, but I believe that together we will uh, we will make it. I'm about to finish, says the speaker. Um, the Child Support Institute has a series of programs, and we get in touch uh, directly with with children. Uh, of course, we are not an organization as uh, uh, the association. Uh, the Portuguese Association for uh, Victim Support, but we are a reference association because we are a network that we've built together with other associations or the organizations that support um, children, and that is why we can uh, work in a network and also in a visible manner. Uh, now in Lisbon, we have a school of second opportunities, and with the um, PRR, we will uh, have six classes, and these are children that uh, have uh, been in uh, institutions uh, and uh, other in educational uh, centers, and uh, we try. Uh, well, these are school dropouts, all of them, and uh, we try to um, provide them with the social uh, skills and personal skills uh, and competences because that is part of uh, uh, that group of uh, things you know those uh, skills educational skills that they lack on the other hand uh, professional training uh, or the beginning of a professional training and that is uh, very important because without these skills without these competencies uh, they will uh, not uh, have what uh, they uh, need for their lives. So I wanted to say that the Child Support Institute is uh, um, free to collaborate with uh, uh, you, Ombudswoman. It will be it will be an honor to be a part of uh, uh, any team that may be created. It is always very good to have an interdisciplinary team to look into all the possibilities and uh, um, this uh, uh, declaration of inconstitutionality cannot be uh, a setback, cannot be a um, trip to the past. Uh, and this is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much for your attention. Bem.
Vamos, vamos avançar rapidamente para o próximo painel. Well, let us move quickly to the next panel. Thank you very much for your presence and I know you will, your work will continue, so see you shortly. Professora Laurentina deve sentar-se aí, não? Ali nem com as duas, pelo menos. Então, pronto. Então, vamos a isso. Está ligado? Está. Olá, muito boa tarde a todos. Muito obrigada. Good afternoon to all. I'm Catarina Canelas. I'm a journalist from CNN Portugal and it's an honor for me to be here and uh, moderate this uh, final panel or at least be the um, common thread and it's a privilege to be here with all of you and I'd like to start with a declaration. I love animals. I have a cat, Slippy, and she's been in my life for nine years and I can't really remember my life before she adopted me. So I'd like to once more thank you all for your presence. Just to remind you that uh, we have very limited time. We have another 40 50 minutes before we end this conference and so i would like to start with eduardo quintanova who is heading several um city councils and so good afternoon i'd like to ask you what's the role of municipalities in dealing with domestic violence cases, especially ones involving pets and aggressions to pets also. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, first of all, to the for the invitation. And as a councilman in charge of health-related issues and well-being and welfare, I'd like to thank Laurentina for her invitation and for the work that she's conducted. And I uh, come from the second largest municipality in Portugal, and it's a challenge to coordinate these aspects in terms of animal protection, and violence towards people, especially towards women, children and the elderly. And municipalities have a determining role when it comes to uh, local policy and when it comes to preventing violence. Not only violence towards people, but violence towards animals. And this reality, which has been discussed here today, is a reality which municipalities are faced with on a daily basis. That's why we have sought through a set of public policies to counteract these phenomena, not only those of domestic violence, but in association with domestic violence, violence towards animals. Just to give you an idea, uh, Sintra Municipality has a municipal plan 
on equality, citizenship and the promotion of human dignity, which also involves all forms of uh, fight against uh, um, violence, uh, but not only just violence against people, but also violence against animals. So we're talking about uh, monitoring um, the aspects pertaining to violence against people and animals and we try to implement the best monitoring uh, systems possible the backup systems and measures measures for instance to such as shelters to house pets who come from contexts of domestic violence as well as obviously shelter for people but we want this to be a combined approach so that animals are not left out when we talk about urgent and temporary housing we have in Sintra not only the local strategic housing plan but the first agreement with uh, the IRU which uh, covers the creation of a center to shelter victims of domestic violence including a place for the pets of these victims to be housed we want an increasingly fairer municipality one which does not coexist with any form of violence be it against people or animals so we want to come up with the necessary answers within the community and municipalities are a good driver for this so that no victim of violence goes without support support for themselves and for their pets but there's a whole array of things that uh, come into play namely training teams with specialized training so that they are able to quickly identify and signal risks risks and signs of violence against people and violence against animals I normally say that what our eyes aren't trained to see they don't see and these people have to be highly trained and I believe that municipalities have a very huge responsibility because they have municipalities, the legal competences uh, to uh, protect animal rights. Municipal employees carry out the different procedures and measures when it comes to providing support to the animal population and monitor and supervise and they are the ones who are going to uh, signal and flag potential signs and cases of violence and therefore it's also fundamental that not only the police forces um, are involved and police forces have to coordinate with municipalities in terms of signaling and supporting victims of domestic violence but also they require training in terms of the animal policies and we have to uh, further modernize and we have done so and I think we're on track and we have representatives here of the public prosecutor's office this is also a matter which has to be closely followed by the public prosecution. One of our coordinators, one of our great partners involved in the field has helped to equip uh, the public prosecutors with the skills and knowledge on uh, animal protection rights as it was said here we have progressed considerably when it comes to us as a society uh, in back in 2014 and we can't accept any setbacks we can't accept that animals 
be treated as things, that they uh, should be characterized as beings, uh, non-sensitive beings, because we would be um, moving backwards. Municipalities are the engines, they have the means, the people, the ability to promote at a local level with non-profit organizations and other institutional partners to actually promote new public policy uh, in order to protect and safeguard not only people but anim and but also animals and this is what we're doing in Sintra and we will continue to do. Thank you ever so much for sharing this very important news with us. I'll now pass the floor to uh, Anna Caldera, who's a doctor. She has uh, been a part of the department um, supporting children and youths at risk. I'd like you to share with us exactly what you do and leave us with the main um, warning signs that we should look out for uh, when we talk about this kind of situation. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the invitation that uh, was addressed to me to be here. It's an honor to be here. Also a privilege to be able to participate in this conference on a topic that is totally new to me. Uh, it is not surprising. I mean, all this makes uh, a lot of sense. And uh, I uh, have been working in this uh, area of uh, uh, child abuse for some time now, but I've never heard of this link. And I think it is important. So uh, congratulations for this uh, initiative. So I wanted to um, explain a little bit. I mean that I'm a pediatrician. I support um, children and youth at uh, young people at risk. Um, I work at Hospital uh, Hospital San Francisco Xavier and uh, at the end of the 80s, 1980s, I believe that it was uh, when the um, hospital started to, to operate um, in a uh, informal manner. Professionals uh, felt the need to create a group. Uh, it didn't have this name at the time, and uh, throughout the years, other um, units were created. And the uh, creation of these units, as they exist to date, started more or less in 2006, 2007. And this was uh, a joint action or rather an action of uh, the General Directorate for Health. And uh, uh, today we have uh, units that support children uh, in uh, at hospitals and health centers. These are multidisciplinary um, units. They are comprise a doctor, a psychologist, a social assistant, and a nurse. Now, um, in this... Uh, Units. Uh, these units are part of a pyramid of, uh, that is devoted to the protection of young people and children. And uh, the basis of this is uh, are the uh, educational uh, institutions. And uh, then, with regards to the system of child protection, we have the committees uh, for the protection of children and uh, youths and at the top we have courts. Now um, in the basis of this uh, pyramid uh, we, um, I mean uh, the health sector and the educational sector, we uh, detect uh, cases of uh, uh, child abuse But we take action, especially in situations where we want to prevent the uh, occurrence of, of abuse. We, we detect uh, situations. Obviously, we have uh, uh, situations that uh, uh, 
we know of uh, uh, via the, the hospital, the ER of the hospital, but uh, we try to prevent uh, situations. Therefore, we need to pay attention to risk factors. And uh, in this area, in fact, as uh, somebody said here, uh, this is something that I will uh, be taking home. Uh, uh, what about everything that we've uh, mentioned here today? And uh, in fact, uh, throughout these years, I've been working in these areas. I've uh, come across few situations uh, where um, animal animal abuse was described, or at least this link with animals. Most likely, it exists, but we don't look for, for this kind of situation. So I will take this uh, with me, I will take this to my institution and also to the institutions we work with, because this is a network uh, at a level of human beings. Uh, you know, this, this network is very much uh, uh, organized. Uh, uh, and in fact, this is very important. I mean, this link with, with animals is very important. And uh, uh, in fact, it may be there we act in, in risk situations. So it is even more important to ask uh, in a um, proactive manner, you know, regarding uh, animals who make us questions, because this can help us to prevent um, abuse uh, situations. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing that with us, because this is, uh, in fact, a proof that uh, these meetings are fundamental, and it is very urgent to organize uh, these kind of meetings. And I'm sure that uh, uh, this meeting will bear fruit, and I'm sure that you um, will um, be more aware uh, regarding what we mentioned here today. And now I'd like to speak to Ricardo Lobo. This, he is the municipal. Uh, veterinary Medical Authority. Now, what is the role of the um, municipal uh, veterinary regarding the situation of, of pets? And uh, well, good afternoon. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the invitation that was addressed to me by um, the uh, ombudswoman, and uh, I'm very honored to be uh, here. And I hope that this is the uh, first step of a uh, road that we need to walk on together with uh, uh, other stakeholders. Now, um, municipal veterinarians are very important uh, in this network because uh, most of the times, together with the uh, um, authorities with the police uh, uh, forces, we are the first to um, uh, respond to, to uh, a situation. So uh, we have uh, things or issues that are very important. I mean, uh, should we uh, froze the body of an animal or not? Uh, uh, should we speak with the uh, our colleagues? Uh, uh, of uh, uh, there are pathologists, and when we elaborate our reports that were mentioned here by uh, Annabella, um, and also because we like the support from other entities, we sometimes feel the need to um, have. Uh, actually um, exert our skills to the maximum extent uh, and sometimes we understand that there is uh, something wrong in a certain situation we are not psychologists we do not belong to that area of expertise but we are uh, tempted to to uh, make a judgment uh, regarding the uh, capability of someone uh, keeping a pet or not so this work should be uh, done together with psychologists and with other the stakeholders uh, if we are to do it well. So we still have a long way to go. Together with police forces, we've uh, made a lot of progresses. Also, together with uh, the um, uh, public prosecutors, 
of course, we uh, will at municipal level we will also have, we will always have um, an area for urgent situations where we can uh, actually um, receive these animals. So, uh, nevertheless, we need a uh, another type of response. We need to create places where victims can live and uh, keep their pets with with them. Uh, but we uh, could, in fact, uh, um, welcome those uh, animals in uh, our uh, municipal facilities uh, uh, on a temporary basis. Um, we uh, got lots of information, important information from, from this event, and we will be available to collaborate in the net networks we may uh, create after this meeting. Thank you very much for this uh, very specific information and also for uh, explaining your role, which is very important uh, one. I would like to speak to... Um, Alexandre Pereira and the guardianship of the welfare and companion animals and uh, um, the government decided to transfer uh, the um, guardianship of animals from uh, uh, to ICNF and I would like to ask you uh, what is your role whenever you um, get these cases of uh, abuse of animals? Well, good afternoon everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, um, uh, Laurentina for organizing this event and all of you I believe I've, I've learned a lot uh, and I think all of us have learned a lot uh, uh, during this event. ICNF uh, is responsible for the guardianship of uh, pets for less than one year. A lot of work has been done. One of our uh, competences has to do with uh, um, applying in Portugal the P European Convention on uh, Pets, uh, I should say that uh, we've uh, been mentioning uh, work in a network uh, a lot here today, and uh, this is something that we are trying to to promote. We recognize that that even. All of us would be very little, and this uh, area requires a multidisciplinary approach. And uh, despite you know Law Twenty Seven uh, Two Thousand and Sixteen that uh, um, forbids the uh, um, killing of of uh, uh, of, of uh, stray animals, uh, we have not uh, worked uh, on this area as a network and ICNF has had uh, you know that the role of bringing together all these stakeholders and uh, of course this uh, is uh, uh, this involves several areas and the role of ICNF has uh, been that of creating, of building capacities among all that are part of this network. For instance, um, associations that protect environment are uh, have one only one single entity, CPAR, and it is very easy to have these associations participating in public policies. We have some difficulty um, with regards to animal associations. Uh, so, um, one of the main objectives of ICNF, and this is part of a resolution of the Council of Ministers of 2021 that created a national program for pets, and this has to do with the uh, registration of uh, pet animal associations uh, in public uh, policies. We don't know how many um, animal associations we have, how they operate, and um, we feel that they can contribute uh, to bring about, uh, to achieve our objectives and uh, um, much of our work has to do with uh, uh, 
building capacity among uh, animal associations uh, so that they can uh, create or build shelters and participate in these uh, public policies and also all the other stakeholders we have a training program that has been designed for all those that intervene in these areas we will start uh, this year with uh, um, municipal uh, veterinaries uh, they are in on the first line of, of, of uh, in the forefront of this uh, fight and the idea is to, ex to extend all this to all the veterinarians we've been um, working in several training actions to actually um, involve everybody in the network, including the community. Um, we need to uh, work with the uh, uh, NGOs, the whole community. Um, and we see that there is a tremendous potential for this. And today we're speaking especially of uh, domestic violence. And uh, uh, we did not speak about the possibility of, uh, uh, you know, um, taking animals to a uh, uh, shelter um, center. Uh, but uh, sometimes we have a lot of potential at the level of uh, uh, temporary families. This has not been regulated uh, um, at the level of uh, regulation. This is not duly regulated. The concept does not exist. It is not. Uh, it has not. It is not part of the legislation. So, besides uh, revising all the current legislation and harmonizing uh, all the legislation, we are working. Uh, in order to promote the involvement of all the community. Now, on this area and uh, uh, for animals that whose owners are in a situation of special vulnerability, uh, ICNF approved in February a um, task force, a group that involves uh, NGOs and uh, uh, government uh, uh, institutions, uh, uh, municipal veterinaries uh, and uh, associations that are devoted to protection of victims in order to create uh, mechanisms to respond and tools that promote the well-being of animals. So this is a work group that will interact with other um, groups, with other work groups, uh, in order to design several solutions to uh, respond to uh, much of what has been mentioned here. I would like also to say that this work group has uh, also uh, resulted uh, you know, from, from all these uh, difficulties that we've identified and uh, uh, also to uh, animals uh, uh, that belong to hoarders and uh, together with ISPA we've elaborated a uh, handbook to intervene, to intervene in this uh, kind of institutions, the NOAA uh, syndrome. This is a uh, guide with multidisciplinary approaches because we know that these uh, situations end up uh, by uh, falling under the attributions of a um, municipal veterinary and he has not uh, received training for this kind of situation. So this uh, um, guide uh, includes a multidisciplinary approach uh, to bring together all the uh, organizations, all the stakeholders um, to uh, prevent a um, uh, Reincidents in 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 uh, this uh, uh, area. This uh, guide is available uh, in our uh, web page, uh, but we will be um, working uh, together with this uh, uh, in this group that I've mentioned for uh, animals that belong to uh, special that are specially vulnerable, vulnerable uh, namely uh, homeless people, people that are victims of uh, domestic uh, violence and people in a situation of extreme poverty. 
so all the situations so as to uh, create uh, tools and I hope to bring this uh, or to be able to speak about some of the solutions that uh, this work group uh, will find in the near future. Thank you very much. Uh, eu tenho seguido particular. I have uh, followed especially the work of the ICNEF, the Nature Conservation uh, Institute, with the work I do uh, in uh, environmental protection. So I wish you the best of success and continuation of good work. These were the speakers who hadn't spoken uh, today yet, and now I'll turn to our resident speakers. Pass the floor to Manuel Alberno of the Commission for Citizenship and Gender Equality. Your role is very important to establish uh, the link between violence uh, against people and violence towards uh, animals. And I'd like to ask whether there are still many victims who haven't been able to ensure the safety of their pets coming out of domestic violence situations. Well, I believe Sophia sp spoke uh, to great lengths about this and literature. Uh, the SIG is the coordinating entity which manages or helps coordinate all of those uh, organizations involved in um, support uh, to victims uh, by creating uh, validation and interv intervention instruments. This is our social role. But responding to your question, we all know the relationship there is or can exist between uh, domestic violence and violence against and towards animals. And many, many examples were given today of situations where animals, pets, are abused and are used as a, a means of preventing the human victim uh, from being able to leave or react because pets are considered a member of the family by the victims at least and so there is this constant um, issue at stake and this conference is fundamental for us to try and understand to what extent uh, can we all and the CIG has found its own mechanisms working in collaboration with municipalities for trying to find the best shelters uh, for all the victims involved but we also know that obviously human shelters and, and shelters for victims. If, for instance, we have one which only has a 30-person occupancy and all the occupants take their pets, this may bring about other um, health uh, concerns. So we need this necessary network so that we can come up with the best solutions at a territorial level in terms of the different abilities and capacities involving both uh, animal uh, protection structures as well as victim support structures. And we welcome uh, the interest of uh, all of the organizations, namely that of uh, APAV, uh, so that within the CIG, we can move forward and coordinate and congregate all of these organizations within this uh, global framework aiming at uh, fighting this situation. And this is fundamental in order to try and provide a quality response. 
and as I said in my talk, in domestic violence we work with volunteers, but they are professional volunteers. We do not work with just mere charity volunteers which are fundamental at the role they play, but here we need people who are formally trained and validated by those who can validate the knowledge and the skills in order to make sure that we uphold the best quality uh, in the uh, proceedings and the processes we carry out because we don't want to run the risk of victimizing second time round all of these people and animals who are already suffering. And I'd like to now move to Daniel Kutri. Manuel Albeno has already mentioned fundamental aspects, but as a representative of this association for victim support, you also obviously work at a multidisciplinary level. So what's still required to be able to operate at this highly complex level mentioned by Manuel Albeno? And are these shelters all ready uh, to receive and uh, these families with pets? What needs to be done? You've asked a rather naughty question. You want me to be brief. Just to say uh, to the ICNF that uh, APAV is available as NGO uh, to work concerning your question whether these shelters are already equipped. No, they're not. They're not equipped. And I apologize for the swift response, nor are they equipped uh, to uh, house elderly men or women with mobility issues or people with visual impairments. When it comes to animals, and this is a need, a clear need to adapt and equip these shelters, but we must bear in mind also that emergency shelters are managed by civil society organizations, but they are supported by social security. So we have yet another partner which has to be brought to the table to discuss and debate the topic, because we need to make the necessary adaptations and adjustments in order to maintain an animal, whichever animal it is, and let us just think about the ordinary ones, let's say dogs and cats, let us not take into account any others, this has costs and a shelter is a response which houses people and manages in a very commercial, speaking now in a very commercial way, all of the expenses pertaining to that person. If we look at animals as a member of the family unit, then Social Security has to be able to factor this in as well. Then there are other issues. Issues, for instance, that Manuel has brought up. Matters pertaining to the um, hygiene conditions which may be uh, made available. Not all shelters have an open area where animals could more easily be sheltered. And we also have to think about the technical teams as a coordinator for shelter responses. I conducted a survey amongst the people who work at the few structures we organized to understand this and it was amazing to realize that 45% of the staff 
working at these shelters either are afraid of animals, namely dogs, or have allergy conditions. So is the response in the shelters? Not, it may be, but not only. We have to call in other partners, important ones, such as Social Security, for instance. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was very enlightening and you've left uh, a very clear uh, sign and um, remark as to um, all the those who need to be involved. I'd now like to pass the floor over to Dulz Rocha. Dulz Rocha, you've done a remarkable work at the Child Support Institute. We know that uh, there is a uh, a request for some alterations to the law in order to be able to better uphold children's rights. And my question is, given your experience, are these physical and psychological acts of violence towards children, can they also provide an indication of some sort of violence or abuse towards animals? Because we know that these things are generally hand in hand. Well, yes, what we observe more frequently, and uh, in actual fact, on this uh, topic, I uh, sent a, a message to Danielle Coutrin, who is a psychologist, uh, on the matter, and actually asking him, because I'm a uh, a jurist, I'm a legal expert, so I had actually asked him whether there was any, let's say, clear correlation in his work. The major concern during the pandemic were the grandparents, that the anxiety, um, children were often used to uh, spend a lot of time with their grandparents and that instilled a lot of uh, anxiety in children because maybe they were more, I don't know, uh, protected to a certain extent by grandparents and there was a sense that they were feeling unprotected. They weren't going to school, they were experiencing situations where they couldn't um, open up and we were very frightful of sexual abuse situations. So we were not, uh, we did not have any reporting on animal abuse, but I must say that at the um, court for minors, there were several um, testimonies and uh, statements by children and women who stated that they refused to leave the uh, place uh, where they suffered violence because they had pets uh, or puppies. And this is a, tr a serious concern, even children. Children feel that they have to protect their pets as well. And when we looked into um, these situations, we found that there had actually been threats towards uh, the integrity of animals. We are conducting a study at the University of Coimbra on the um, abuse and ill treatment towards animals and actually there was a very interesting article back in 2008, 2009 maybe, prior to the uh, law, approval of the law on ill treatment towards animals. It was on serial killers and very violent crime making reference to prisoners, inmates who had confided and because often those studies um, cover, uh, are conducted with anonym, uh, an, uh, anonymous respondents. And the article, although not mentioning Portuguese studies, mentioned uh, things that were said by these um, inmates. Yak also has uh, 
um, the Child Support Institute, the uh, IAC has a hotline where people that people can call up and report situations. Well, thank you very much. I know the remarkable work that you all do at the Institute. Thank you very much. I now pass the floor to Bruno Branco. You have the microphone with you. Okay, we are very many of us here. You are uh, from the police force. Mr. Commissioner, we are increasingly confronted uh, with cases, shocking cases of abuse and ill treatment towards animals, pets in general. So who tends to report these cases primarily and what's your main responsibility in responding to this? Well, good afternoon. The, fir the main reports reach us via email. That has been the major source, especially because it's the one which uh, more easily ensures anonymity. We are, are aware that many of the cases reported come from neighbors who are afraid of uh, reprisals family members and so they just quickly um, register a temporary email and use it to report the incidents. So what we do as an in initial response is a triage to understand the severity of the incident being reported sometimes through photos or videos which are sent to us when these cases are reported, we assess the severity. For severe cases, the environmental protection services and the patrol car go to the location. If they are cases that can be better studied to, in, um, to look at the background, then we do this uh, so that we can establish a better connection between the different variables. My question also is, have you felt greater awareness from civil society and have you received more complaints, more reports during the, this period of the pandemic? Well, the increase during the pandemic was not actually significant. We have had an increase since the onset of the project back in 2015. So annually we have had an increase in the uh, reporting. Thank you, thank you ever so much, Mr. Commissioner. A round of applause. So now I'd like to uh, ask you to pass the microphone over to uh, Ricardo Alves, also um, the Lieutenant Colonel. Could you please give us some more concrete examples which reach you at the GNR service and explain how you uh, respond. We had this example of the commission and now we'd like to listen to what you have to say. Okay, well, I promise to uh, make your life easier and of uh, all the people in the audience. Uh, well, in fact, we have sometimes, uh, you know, shocking reports, you know, in more than the reports, the uh, pictures themselves, you know, um, convey the horror of certain situations. Uh, I do remember, uh, remember a specific situation. A dog had been abandoned uh, in the balcony of a uh, an apartment, one per two meters, and uh, he uh, started to eat himself. Uh, because he didn't have any food to eat. Well, that was particularly shocking for me. Um, uh, and this is one of the cases uh, among many others uh, and changing chapter now moving to the uh, positive aspects in terms of intervention, you know, just as it has been said. Uh, throughout the day, we've uh, improved our procedures. We um, learned uh, 
uh, with our own experience we got inputs from uh, animal associations from other uh, organizations of civil society public institutions that uh, enabled us you know for instance uh, uh, to You know, this has to do with the uh, chain of custody and the sealing of evidence. This was something that uh, we uh, sometimes neglected. I used to say uh, among my peers that we need to um, consider the uh, death of an animal as we consider the death of a person. And I defended a national network of uh, necropsies, you know, what? Uh, happens with uh, autopsies uh, the circuit is very easy very intuitive and I think that we move uh, we need to move uh, uh, along those lines uh, especially from the um, bodies of criminal police to actually um, provide adequate evidences and um, another aspect uh, was the collaboration internally you know what we have as good practice for other um, typology of crimes i don't know i would not go as far as uh, a homicide but uh, uh, you know in a burglary for instance you need to collect evidence and all those steps were um, transposed so to speak to the area of pets and uh, this brought a lot of relevance uh, to uh, procedures themselves. Thank you very much, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, for uh, what you said. And in fact, you know, what you said vis-à-vis -vis necropsis is very important to uh, know the origin and to draw the right con conclusions. I thought you were going to forget me, but uh, um, you did not. You, you did not forget me. Um, now, there is a relationship between um, domestic violence and uh, animal abuse, but I have lots of doubts that uh, uh, civil society also has, because uh, we get uh, um, reports of these situations in, in newspapers, and I would like to know whether this relationship is reflected in the current legislation, and uh, what is the difficulty of uh, judicial uh, authorities to protect this uh, uh, victims and animals. I uh, know that in Spain uh, uh, pets are now legally members of the family. Well, here in Portugal, uh, as uh, uh, mentioned uh, by several participants, we've, we uh, were uh, uh, we we're going backwards, I'm afraid. The um, penal framework that was uh, increased some time back continues to be abstract. Somebody that uh, uh, commits a uh, crime of abuse against animals, the uh, penal framework is always uh, uh, smaller than uh, in the case of somebody that decides to destruct uh, uh, an object that uh, does not really make sense. We do not have statistics, we do not have data. The um, public uh, prosecution uh, likes to, to, to resort to statistics a lot, um, but we do not have a statistic with regards to um, uh, the outcome of uh, uh, procedures. Uh, sometimes they are archived because uh, we lack evidence, and even those that are taken to court, it, um, this is the area I monitor right now. Um, there's this kind of funnel effect. And uh, I was there saying that we have very little convictions for this type of crime um, because we have that uh, penal framework. Um, we uh, sometimes tend to suspend uh, procedures, uh, the inquiry is suspended, provided 
the defendant uh, meets uh, certain requirements and if he does uh, you know that the, the process will be archived uh, and uh, there will be no criminal um, record I hope that uh, this is uh, changed so that once and for all we consider this this uh, a, a crime I mean uh, with regards to uh, pets being a member of the family uh, they do not have this this uh, kind of uh, status at least legally speaking it is cons considered as part of the household uh, um, uh, it is part of the uh, domestic violence risk records uh, and this is what I can say to allow uh, one of the members of the table of the, the uh, panel to actually uh, drive to Oporto as far as, uh, as soon as possible the director I see and F I would like to be uh, we would like to be part of, uh, of, of uh, uh, that work group I uh, feel that this panel has been in fact very uh, productive and I would like to thank to all of you a great panel I would like to thank to the members of the audience uh, uh, the organization of this uh, um, conference the uh, ombudswoman uh, animals are a part of our daily life they are our companions and uh, it is great to be adopted by uh, animals I would like you with a small history this happened a few years ago uh, my cat sleepy uh, for me she is a lion uh, um, there was this young lady that was uh, walking in front of uh, uh, my window and she uh, looked at my cat and said uh, mommy look there is a lion over there and uh, mommy corrected and say uh, no uh, it is a cat animals can be whatever we want them to be thank you very much it was an honored to me to be here with you and uh, now to uh, close I would like to give the floor to the uh, to Laurentina uh, Pedros the uh, ambulance for uh, animals <laughs> All those proposals I would like to present, I would, uh, I'm going to leave them for uh, uh, some other time. Otherwise, we would continue to to be here for uh, uh, much more time. But I think that we are concluding um, in the same manner we actually started this morning. This is a work that reflects health, the health of uh, uh, pets, uh, animals, and people, and. Uh, we can only solve you know these kind of issues with multidisciplinary um uh, team this morning i also said that uh, our choice of participants was not an innocent uh, one uh, but we would have to uh, hold a conference for uh, two days or more um, in fact the uh, Ombudsman also uh, wants to create these teams with other uh, teams uh, uh, different from uh, ICNF but also with ICNF with uh, uh, the GAV uh, um, and we will uh, be open to all those uh, all these links and of course all the members of this panel will uh, have a seat in uh, the disciplinary teams we've been mentioning throughout the day. I would like to thank you very much for your participation, the speakers, the uh, moderators, and all those who were with us during the morning, uh, both here in the room and via streaming, and to all of those that are not that are no longer with us. And uh, a round of applause to all of you. Thank you very much.